Hello everybody, Tony Ayala, Lamarada Blog. Oh, it seems like we already got 10 people in here watching. So welcome to everybody uh, to the 2022 20, Norwalk Lamarada Unified School District candidate forum. We have eight candidates. Let's see, is, are they all here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's see, seven. Okay, there's the other one. So they are here. Um, eight candidates. Uh, four spots, I believe, open. Um, tonight's event is hosted by the Lamarada Chamber of Commerce. And we are uh, proud to assist them bringing this to you live here on the Lamarada Blog YouTube channel. And uh, Noel Jaimez just gave the two-minute warning. And we should be getting any second. I'll try to monitor the comments if I can. Uh, I've been rushing around here. But again, welcome. And we are live right now. Had some issues. Didn't know if I can get everybody in, but it looks like I did. And if we can pan over, you can kind of see some of the stuff going on behind the scenes. And we'll try to get some glimpses of the crowd as the night moves on, but right now we're just going to wait for the festivities to begin. I believe Tammy McDuff or Noel Jaime, I'm not sure who's going to speak to lead us off, but we'll see in just a second. I'm going to put this mic up on the tripod and you will not hear me talking anymore. Okay, good evening everyone. I'm Anna Lee Castro with the Long Island. Oh, Academy it's actually Anna Lee. So glad to see everyone's faces today. I have the pleasure of introducing a few guests to start us off the right way for our event here. Uh, first, we have Pastor Jack Miranda to give us our invitation. Thank you, Anna. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm an ambassador with the Chamber of Commerce and the faith leader in the city of La Mirada. And if you'll stand with me, we're going to pray and we're going to give a pledge of allegiance. And uh, then we're going to, if I can use my, uh, my uh, boxing voice, let's get ready to rumble. <laughs> I'm teasing, of course. Uh, let me calm it down, take my head off. Well, Lord, thank you. Thank you for these candidates interested in uh, leading a very important institution in our community, our schools. Uh, would you bless this time? Would you make it uh, uh, important, significant, relevant, truthful? Uh, can we keep civility uh, at the foremost? And uh, that you would prevail in your will. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. And we have one of our fearless leaders, Richard Trujillo, to lead us in the flag salute. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. I'm the immediate past president. And if you'll face the flag, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. God bless America.
Executive Director Noah Hymes to give us our welcome. Thank you, Anna, and welcome La Mirada and Norwalk residents to our first candidate school board election forum, and thank you candidates for all attending. Uh, to be very honest with you, the chamber is totally shocked that all of you eight accepted our invitation. We were never expecting all eight of you to show up, but thank you for being here. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity to take a moment to reflect on who we are as uh, Americans. And I was thinking of what to share with you, besides a warm welcome. And it occurred to me that 248 years ago, our founding fathers created a constitution by which we are allowed to have this forum and the public to select their leaders. A few years later, we had a civil war to keep the union together. And since then, we fought two more wars, and now we are challenged with many philosophical differences amongst ourselves that are dividing our nation. This is an opportunity for you, the voter, the public, the parents, the business people, elected leaders, to have a voice in this candidate forum. This is why the chamber is taking the leadership in taking this in video format, and we thank the La Mirada blog for being part of this and carrying this in live stream. So, Anthony, thank you very much for being part of this event. Yeah. These are our leaders and want to be leaders. Recently in La Mirada, we had a city election in which a city council member was elected by three votes. So if you believe that your vote doesn't matter, consider that what happens here at the local level. Your vote is very important. So we invite you to pay attention to the candidates' responses to questions and we will be giving an opportunity to all of you to ask questions from this podium at the second half of this forum. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our Vice President, Jason Fong, who will explain the format of this evening's program. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Tonight, we're gonna to go ahead and mix things up a bit. The intention is to make sure that things remain exciting and to help everybody understand a little bit about every little every candidate that's running for the Norwalk La Mirada School Board. Overall, each candidate will have two minutes to, to respond to the question. And after the overall question up section, they will have an additional three minutes to share with us their vision of what they of what the um, uh, what the vision it would be for the school board in the event that they're elected and also why they, they're running for election. To get everything warmed up, we're gonna go ahead and start with the chamber questions. Then after the chamber questions, like Noel said, the audience will have an opportunity to ask their own questions here at this podium here by forming a line right behind it. Like Noel said, this will be streamed live on YouTube. If you know anybody that can't make it tonight, please, we encourage you to let them know that they should visit the La Mirada Chamber of Commerce website, no, sorry, not website, Facebook page for the link so they can, too, see at the same time as all of us is, um, is seeing it. So without further ado, please help me welcome our president, Tammy McDuff. Good evening, everyone. We do have some uh, elected officials, and I would like for our uh, the city council and the other school board members that I see, and also we have some commissioners. Would you all please stand? I see you guys, come on. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. I want to read a little bit of information about our, our moderator, and I am so pleased to have her here. Her father was an immigrant from Ecuador, and her mother is an immigrant from Mexico. Her father came from a very poor background and was orphaned at a very young age along with his sisters. The local Catholic boarding school took pity on the children and offered to help them by taking them into their boarding school where they remained for several years. Uh, her father came to this country in his early 20s looking for opportunity. Her mother also immigrated 
um, from a poverty-stricken town in Mexico where the huts they called home were made of rusty corrugated metal. Her mother also immigrated into the United States in her 20s. Although they were raised within a Hispanic culture, they were always taught to love and respect this country. She grew up in a low-income community in Los Angeles with her brothers and sisters. Her father always raised them to be independent, stand up for what they believed in, and protect those who could not protect themselves. When she and her husband married, they decided to raise their family in Huntington Beach and its family-friendly environment. Her children attended Harborview Elementary and immediately noticed the disparity between an education in Huntington Beach and one in Los Angeles schools. She developed a deep sense of appreciation for the safety, protection, and opportunity Huntington Beach offered her family. She became aware of adult material that the vast majority of board district members and administration did not know about and that was hidden within the curriculums. Her frustration with this lack of oversight is what led her to run for a seat on the board of Ocean View School District. Although she did not win the seat, she has remained engaged both locally and in Sacramento, where her persistence as a united front has finally convinced the State Department of Education to remove the offensive material. These actions protected thousands of families from uh, material that was not age appropriate. Her knowledge in this field made her the, the appropriate moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you, Gracie Vandermark. Gracie Vandermark, and um, I did grow up in Los Angeles, uh, but I did move to Huntington Beach 22 years ago. So it's kind of nice to come back to the side of that community. Um, so I would like to thank you guys first. I mean, this is not an easy task. I run for the school board. It's a challenge. There are some really rough times, so for people to step up, um, it's commendable. So thank you for doing that. So I will be asking some questions. Um, I'll start with the chamber questions, and I uh, will let you know when, if you guys need any kind of clarity, let me know. Okay, my first question. Um, I can't see that far, so I have to get my ears. And if I mispronounce your name, please correct me. My first question will be for Mr. Chattel. Critical race theory, or CRT, began and has been taught in colleges and universities over 30 years as an adult topic. Will critical race theory be taught in any form whatsoever at Norwalk La Mirada? Um, so, no, I'm, oh, sorry. Um, so, no, uh, I'm not entirely uh, sure what you mean by uh, critical race theory. Uh, the only thing that I'm particularly aware of is uh, the ethics, uh, or the, the ethnic studies, um, which, um, by my understanding, is um, is effectively just um, uh, just teaching just the different kind of diversities of um, um, uh, uh, different cultures and just different backgrounds. Uh, that's at least uh, my understanding. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Vidal? Uh, thank you, and thank you for having us here today. Uh, we do not teach critical race theory at our schools, and we won't. Uh, at this time, if you think that we teach critical race theory, please come and talk to us and give us your concerns. We do teach subjects that are very difficult at times, but we have to do that. Uh, we do teach with a respectful manner to everyone, but we do not teach critical race theory. That is hyperbole, and it's not present in our schools. Thank you. So our goal for educating our students in ethnic studies is absolutely to have those robust discussions of full history of our uh, nation and uh, how um, people were marginalized. I, I have to uh, disagree that I see many core tenets of critical race theory in our 
curriculum and especially in our trainings, um, what would you say about a curriculum that says there's only one perspective unless there are equal outcomes, a system is not fair, that a system, um, that our school system is beyond fixing and has to be entirely transformed, that students need to have their consciousness awakened to their own racism and racism around them. So I would love to chat with anyone who would like to see examples of that. Um, we purchase a lot of materials from UCLA Center X. They are actually known as a fountainhead of CRT in education. I mean, it doesn't bring me any pleasure to share this with you, but the core tenants are in those trainings. Unconscious bias, social justice, um, these are many buzzwords that bring an emotional response, but they are, um, they are representative of core critical race theory tenants. Thank you. Can I rebut that? Uh, it seems like that was a challenge towards what I was saying. I think if, if you believe that we are teaching critical race theory, please, please let us know uh, right away. Show us where. Now, some of the claims that have been going out there was that we're teaching kids to be communists. My daughter took that. She loves America more than anybody else. So if, if you're trying to create something out of hyperbole, please come and show it to us. We do not teach critical race theory. That is a law practice. We do not teach it, period. If you want to review the curriculum that we have, we have uh, forums, committees, that you could put your input into to guide those, 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 that curriculum. So there is feedback. We're not trying to create communist folks here. I fought for this country. There's no way in hell we're going to teach people to be communists. Thank you. Mrs. Amesco had the same question. Well, I am part of the board, so I'm going to say no, we don't teach critical theory. It is ethnic studies. That's what we're teaching our students. It's history of diverse cultures in our communities. And uh, yes, I, I really think that you think we're teaching it, please let us know and we'll look into it. I know that it has been discussed, but ethnic studies is something that we are teaching. And yes, we do work with UCLA, but it doesn't mean because they have that program, we're using that ethnic studies program that they have. So just to clarify, yes, we're using UCLA, but we are not teaching critical theory. Okay, this next question will be for Mr. Tamsio. Will you, as a future board member, promise, affirm, and or swear before the audience that you will fight against underlying issues of that that the state is trying to include in the curriculum's instructions that teach us critical race theory? Can you repeat that question, please? It's a little more appropriate. Will you, as a future board member, promise, affirm, and or swear before this audience that you will fight against the underlying issues that the state is trying to include into the curriculum, including those that teach us critical race theory. I think this kind of, thank you for the question. I think it kind of echoes what my fellow colleagues were saying here um, on the stage. We're not in the business of teaching a, a single theory in our district. Uh, we teach our students, our students to be critical in math and English and science. Um, but I mean, I, I took an oath when I was 17 here uh, in the Norwalk Lumber Unified School District to defend this country and fight for it, just like my fellow colleague next to me. Um, and we continue to do so here in the district. So we do not teach it, and um, I do not support anything, any tenets of critical race theory, uh, period. Thank you. Ms. Thank you for this question. Uh, it is often claimed that critical race theory is a a uh, legal issue and it's only law schools. I am a lawyer, I went to law school, I've studied it. Um, it has long since morphed, ever since at least 1995 with Gloria Billings, uh, article on critical race theory in education has long since morphed in, into a theory in education. It's been out of law schools more than 25 years. So that the, uh, it's a uh, gaslighting to say it's just law schools. I, I'm the only one who actually on the stage who is a lawyer who studied it. I know what it is and at the last, um, what we do have is an ethnic studies curriculum. The ethnic studies curriculum at the, the forum in last fall, the director said, we, uh, the ethnic studies is not critical race theory, it uses tenets of critical race theory. That's out of the district's administration's own words. 
In the ethnic studies curriculum, the current book we use is right here. Howard Zinn's A Young People's History of the United States. I've been reading through it. This speaks glowingly of socialism and communism. I challenge you to read it. My uh, colleagues all have uh, a copy. Uh, it speaks glowingly of uh, the history of socialism in the US, of uh, <clears throat> how evil we've been for suppressing it. And I immigrated to the United States from a communist country. I know what socialism is not as a theory, but as fact. My family suffered under it. We fled to the US. Uh, what we use uh, briefly is curriculum that is based on the Liberated Ethnic Studies Model Curriculum Consortium. This is the group that put forward the first draft of the Ethnic Studies Model Curriculum to the state. They were rejected by Gavin Newsom and by the State Department of Education as too extreme. So being rejected by Newsom and the State Department of Education, they regrouped, rebranded, and are now selling it to the districts, including ours. We are using curriculum that was rejected as too extreme by the State Department of Education and by Gavin Newsom, and, and a book that speaks glowingly of socialism. We are teaching it. I love ethnic studies, but what we need to do is have an inclusive ethnic studies that values diversity, not one that pits students against each other. Thank you. Uh, I just want to clarify, I just want to clarify that this forum is made to be truthful. And it's already been pointed out to the district that the misrepresentation of critical race theory is one of the reasons why we're getting divided into districts now. We need to stop trying to make an issue out of something that's not there. If we're making communist kids, where are they? I've got three of them in my house. They love this country. Uh, I don't get it. I think it, it, what we're trying to do is scare the folks into thinking that we're doing something we're not. Show me the data, show me the proof. Who did actually find pornography in our local school curriculum? <laughs> <laughs> um, I was told, and they reaffirmed it was not in the curriculum, the current board, when it actually was there. If a parent here were to find something and some issue with some material, would you be open to listening to them rather than just asserting that it does not exist? Whether well, it's critical race theory, um, pornography that I found that I was told would not exist. Um, but would you be have really have an open door policy to every parent here that believes that there might be something wrong with the curriculum? Of course, yes, we're here for you. We're here for the families, for our students, for our community. So if yes, a parent reaches out to me and wants to speak with me, I'm more than willing to speak to them and respect with the respectful way because yeah, they are they are there because they care about their students. And if there's something that we're doing or that is incorrect. We want to make sure that we target it. So yes, we are open as board members to have a dialogue with our parents. Thank you. Mr. Miranda. How do you intend to have equal representation with the new district lines between the cities of La Mirada and Norwalk when Norwalk has twice the number of voters in their city than La Mirada? Okay, so there have been four meetings set up uh, where all that will be discussed. Uh, my option would be to have at least minimum one representative that overlaps into both cities. That way they have representation on both sides. Uh, I understand that Norwalk, high, Norwalk side has a higher population, but that doesn't mean that they don't have your best interests on mind either. So we can't just say, oh, they're bigger, they, they must be bad for us. No, uh, we, everybody here, is here to represent every single student and do what's best for every single student. And my way of doing it would be to at least have minimum of one uh, representative that is on both sides. That way, uh, as a tiebreaker or anything else, um, we have a lot of uh, fail safe. Thank you. Mrs. Bidari, did I say that correctly? Yes. Same question. Yes, I agree with my colleague here. I would definitely want to have equal representation. 
uh, of all cities, regardless of the uh, population. <laughs> okay, Mr. Concio, same question. Thank you for the question. I mean, it's relatively simple. Uh, this is a question of equity and a question of equality. Um, the discussions that we've had so far in the district, uh, in our meetings, and we'll have, as Mr. Miranda pointed out, we'll have a few more discussions have been about making maps that, are, that give equitable opportunities for communities that have not traditionally spoken and been part of the dialogue that has happened here in the district. And so uh, I'm excited for uh, what's to come. I, I think that you know, we're in good hands. The community is creating and co-creating our maps together. Um, and, and that's that's where we need to be. I think there, there, there's no problem when one city controls the whole district, but all of a sudden, we're starting to have conversations about what is equitable and what is equal, then there's a call to arms. And I think that we really need to take a step back and, and look at you know, what we're talking about. And more importantly, every board member uh, that I know present serving on the board doesn't just serve their niche, their community, they serve the whole district. And I have full trust and confidence and fidelities that that would be the case when we go into districts. Thank you. back on what he was saying about um, just uh, us making sure that each area uh, has equality but also uh, uh, there's the equity uh, within um, uh, sorry um, I have a, not the best speech impediment sorry um, so um, uh, so the main thing that uh, I think that each uh, each area does need to have equal say um, but um, but to have uh, that, uh, that each side, um, oh sorry, um, um, uh, sorry, I'm uh, still uh, uh, fairly new to this. Um, um, so, uh, uh, sorry, let me start over. Um, so each side, I think, just uh, needs to have equal say, um, but uh, the factor in that uh, there's, uh, there's different sides of the population that also needs to be considered, and I know that uh, there's really no one right answer um, in terms of, um, I say equal say, but I think that the districts uh, would be just a good option. Thank you. Mrs. Langan Walter, as a future board member, what will you do to oppose or prohibit any Planned Parenthood abortion clinic? by any name or designation to be funded by the Norwalk Colorado School budget and or funding by any private, local, county, and or state funding on any and all school property. Um, what, um, what would I do to oppose it? Um, great question. I know this is a question that our community was uh, very close up to in uh, July 18th when over 300 individuals showed up to uh, out of concern that there had been a recommendation to put a Planned Parenthood uh, clinic on John Glenn High School. Uh, parents overwhelmingly spoke that they do not want those type of services, that organization, that philosophy in proximity to their child's education. We have those services in the community. There's actually a Planned Parenthood uh, clinic six miles from here. Uh, it's not like those services are not available for that precocious student, okay? But um, it was really um, very strongly opposed by the community, and as a board member, I would feel it would be my responsibility to to hear all sides, to represent that. Um, and again, if um, you know there were talk of pharmaceuticals, abortifacients, the hormones, that all these things, there's been a very uh, uh, vagueness we want to know exactly. I think the community wants to know what services would be offered if it were by a different name, um, unequivocally that that would be decided and there would be full transparency. One of the big problems was that, as you know, probably 12 year olds and old, older in California can have services without parental consent. Parents don't wanna be excluded from important medical decisions that their children might make or, or gender transitioning process. 
So it's a really important topic. The consent thing was a big piece. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Planned Parenthood um, at this point, or at any point that I can see, is not going to be appropriate for the community uh, at the school level. Um, what we need to focus on is getting appropriate services. We need uh, mental health, uh, medical, and more nurses, uh, people that they can speak to, and they have those in the wellness centers right now. We're going in the right direction. So, Planned Parenthood is, is no longer an issue. It, it has been voted down, it is not going to happen. What we should be focusing on is where are we going from here? How are we gonna help the students? Uh, there's a lot of students right now that, that need help uh, with uh, drugs. LA County just had a death in, the, in a restroom. That is a horrible thing to, to go through. Um, let's focus on that. Planned Parenthood, done, over. So we need to do is get medical, uh, social, emotional, um, somebody to talk to, um, somebody for them to help them um, interact appropriately with others, and to stay away from, from drugs. That's what we need to focus on. Thank you for the question. Yes, I, I do want to clarify for the community. I agree with my colleagues that it, it is done. Uh, if there's any confusion, let me make it clear, it is off the agenda, it won't be coming back. Um, we'll, we'll be coming back. What the superintendent has said, we'll, we'll be doing. You know, we're looking to set up other kinds of services, perhaps parent education. But for those worried about a resurgence of the Planned Parenthood idea, it's not coming back. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, I, I obviously would oppose it coming back. I opposed it this time. Uh, the, the question is, what would I do? Same thing I did this time. Without commentary, without stating my opinion, let the public know. Um, there's been talk about, well, that somehow violates the Brown Act. No, it doesn't. Uh, it's letting the public know what our, uh, what is before the board, the public is, has a right to know what is coming up. And so I would, uh, I would let the public know and let, let the community come to its own decision. Um, I do oppose it, but please be, let's be clear that it is off the agenda and it's not coming back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's a lot of misconception going on here on what actually happened, what didn't happen. Um, we have to understand this is not, uh, th there was no decision that was made uh, by individual board members. Uh, there were Brown Act violations and those Brown Act violations uh, were when you put your own explicit opinion um, prior to a meeting. That's very different than giving information to the public. Um, but the Norwalk Lombard Unified School District is not in the business of, uh, it's not in the business of, of doing other than teaching our students how to be lifelong learners and how to be healthy. We are fortunate now that in our district, in all of our high schools and our middle schools, and we're trickling down to our elementary schools, we're providing mental health and wellness centers. That's more than appropriate. Um, my uh, fellow member up here on the, on, the, uh, on the stage is absolutely correct. Uh, we should be focusing on health, knowledge, education, parent education, and one big hot topic that we have here in our district is nurses. We need more nurses. And so those are the conversations that we're having. We're trying to make sure that we don't only have safe spaces here in our school sites, but we have healthy spaces in our school sites for all of our teachers, our staff, and more importantly, our students. Thank you. Thank you. As a board member, would you be willing to support equal number of districts in each city with a single at-large president for the entire Norwalk Lamarada? Um, repeat it? Yeah. Yes. As a board member, would you be willing to support equal number of districts in each city with a single at-large president for the entire Norwalk Lamarada? I'm not too familiar with that, but what I would initially do if I were involved in that decision-making process is definitely research it a lot in order to, make, to be able to make a, a good, an informed decision. Thank you. Mrs. Megan Walter? Mm -hmm. Same question. Yes. yes. Um, I actually would not. I understand we have many more voters in Norwalk, and I believe in uh, represent, representative uh, structure to our 
um, I, to our governance. I, I think it's a great disservice. I'm really sorry that we were approached as a district and asked to break up into districts because we actually have a very diverse board. Three members live in Norwalk, four in La Mirada, but a diversity of um, uh, ethnicity, if you will. Um, and so I think it's unfortunate that um, we, but I do agree actually with the decision that the board made to go along with that breaking up into districts because of the financial burden that would have put on us and we need those funds for, uh, for other things. Um, so yeah, that, that to me, again, I liked it. This time I'm gonna be able to vote for up to four members of a school board. So I get to pick a big section of the leadership of the board. The board acts as a unit and I only get to vote for one or may, my person in my district and then maybe one at large. I think it, it diminishes representation for, uh, for voters, but I don't know what recourse we have other than to go along with what seems to be the current trend. But I don't think that would actually be fair to give the same number of votes on either side when there are obviously more people, a lot more elementary students in Norwalk than in La Mirada. Um, I do have confidence that the board will act as a unit, but I don't think that would actually be fair. Thank you. So now, um, uh, just so I understand the question, uh, uh, it was uh, representing uh, both districts equally, correct? Uh, your question? Would you like me to call repeat? Uh, yes, please. Sorry. As a board member, would you be willing to support equal number of districts in each city with a single at-large president for the entire Norwalk La Mirada School District? Um, um, I, um, I would personally uh, be willing to entertain that idea, uh, personally uh, for me now. Uh, so I'm, I'm fairly new to the whole um, school board and political uh, realm here. Um, I'm just a new father uh, with a son in the district. I'm just trying to just be a voice. Uh, so I'm uh, uh, personally just trying to get in here to try to educate myself more on um, on the district, so that's something that uh, uh, personally I would be willing to entertain, but I, um, I personally don't have enough to make a full decision or answer right now. Thank you, uh, Mr. Miranda. Thank you for the question. Um, I think that proposing it right off the bat uh, to be done in that manner. Um, there's some questions that need to be answered and you need to ask yourself before you decide whether or not, whether or not it's right. Um, that format, what it will do is for one, it, the person that is president, basically they're not gonna be representing just their district as the way the trustee system is supposed to work. If you model it that way, it kind of falls more as a PTA model and uh, with the PTA model, uh, what happens is the president actually does not have a vote unless it's a tie-breaking vote. So now, again, you're removing the say from that member unless they're breaking a tie. So I think that that model is creating more questions than it's answering. Um, I'm open to discussing it. Um, I, I welcome questions. I, I think it'd be a good model to discuss it and view how it works against other models. Um, but just right off the bat, as soon as you said it, the, that's what came to my mind. That person should not be voting unless it's a tiebreaker, and that person, therefore, does not have a say for the area. So there, there's complications with that. So I, I would not support it unless we compare it to other models um, together. Thank you. Excuse me? Yes. May I? Sure. And, and just, I'm only going to entertain it because Noel had the audacity to bring up the Constitution in the beginning of this forum. Uh, but anyone that reads the Constitution has to understand uh, what does it mean to be a pro, what does it mean to have appropriate representation? And I encourage all of you to read the Virginia Plan and to please be best friends with James Madison in his early work. Um, I, I just want to answer this question. We will entertain no other model than appropriate representation that spelled out already in the Constitution. Um, we believe in local governance and 
And I think this is a question of equity, and our forefathers had this discussion. We have these documents that we've been using in our country for a very long time, and they seem to work. So I will not entertain anything else than equity when it comes to maps in our district. Thank you. question is for Mrs. Amesco. The California Teachers Association proposed that in the name of equity, all students have access to hormone therapy, including hormone replacement therapy, without the barrier of parental permission. Do you agree with this recommendation? And if you do, could you explain? That's tough. I don't agree on it. I don't. Um, Especially because I, I do believe a parent should be involved in any of this decision making. Uh, it is tough when it, it comes from CDE, if it's coming from the California Department of Education and we have to abide by it. But other than that, uh, no, I do not. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't, I would oppose to it. Thank you. Mr. Bressa? Likewise, uh, I, I would be opposed. Um, to be to be clear, we don't do that as a district now. So, unless there, if there's any doubt about that, that, that is not the case in our district. But if it ever were to come up, or possibly could have come up through the Planned Parenthood, um, I would be opposed to that for the same reasons. I believe parents need to be involved, and we should not be in the business of alienating our parents. Um, we are at the end of the day a service, and parents have cars. Uh, they can go to other districts if they. Um, we're not bound here, and we need to stop that. We are we're hemorrhaging students as it is, and we I would be opposed to anything that like that that continues to erode trust. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Walter, mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much for the question. Um, yes, the state puts out a lot of guidelines, but. Um, that doesn't mean that we as a district cannot decide to do what our parents and our community sees is appropriate and fit. Um, there are districts that we, we don't have to exclude parents from any 12 year old um, uh, who's getting services. We don't have to do that. Um, those laws, um, well, uh, so as a district, I think we need to really, um, if, if in fact we, we do believe parents should be involved, then we need to follow through with that. And just because the state makes recommendations that that's an option for a 12 year old, it doesn't mean we as a district have to follow that. There are plenty of districts in the area that don't handle uh, issues that way. And there's another, uh, another policy, I'm drawing a blank right now, I'm sorry, but um, where we have some latitude in that, uh, ethnic studies, uh, to go on to that topic. We do have to teach ethnic studies in four years or five. It will be a high school graduation requirement. Do we have to teach the liberated version? We do not. There's enough room in the recommendation coming down from the state that we as a district get to pick what we think is best and what our parents want. Thank you. Thank you. I, I am not particularly familiar with, uh, uh, with the guidelines that you're speaking of, um, but I personally believe that parents uh, should be involved in the healthcare of their children. Um, so I would just stick to saying, like, provide them with appropriate healthcare, appropriate healthcare. So mental health, uh, nursing, uh, psych uh, psychiatric. So that would be my focus. Thank you. Mr. Council, as many of us parents are aware, a minor in public schools may not be given an aspirin or a neosporin without written parental permission. However, a child of any age can consent to have an abortion without the permission or knowledge of parents, as well as be given birth control. What are your thoughts on this? I'm almost feeling like I'm not in a uh, friendly debate for school boards with these questions. Right, uh, right, what is this? Yeah. 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 I, I this is not what's happening in the classroom. But uh, I, I, I digress. Uh, the normal, normal, as a product, 
as actually, and please forgive me, anyone on the stage, as the only product of the Norwalk Lamar Unified School District right. on this uh, on this stage, I assure you that we are in the business of teaching our students well, to be yeah. lifelong learners. Period. We're not having discussions about providing these types of services. We're not entertaining it. We do not do it, and this is inappropriate to ask that question. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, it's happening in many schools. I've seen it myself. Uh, in Norwalk? Well, it's not happening in Norwalk, Norwalk Unified School Norwalk? District. I'll tell you that right now. Yes. What are you talking about? Show us the proof. This is a mezcla. Same question. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to echo Dr. Cancio. It's ridiculous. It is. We're here so that you guys can tell us what you would want to hear. And we're not, we're not talk, we already talked about We're not going to have a Planned Parenthood. We're not going to bring in abortion clinics. You guys know that already. Let's go with the good questions about academics, about helping and supporting our students. Ooh. Mental health. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Miranda, same question. Waste <laughs> right. of time. I, I have to agree with that. We're, we're just what, like fourth question regarding Planned Parenthood or abortion. Um, those are non issues. Um, it's not on the board. I mean, sorry, it's not, it's not on the agenda. It's not going to happen. But we need to move on. We need to focus on what does need to be done, not what could have possibly happened. So I'm going to revert back to my previous uh, answer and say that we need to focus on mental health, on, on the child, on the quality of education, appropriate education, and appropriate uh, medical treatment for all students to have available. Do you believe a six-year-old child is cognitively prepared to understand the concept of being assigned a gender as well as learn about this more than a This is ridiculous. If yes, why? If no, what is your plan to make sure that these materials are not in our children's schools? I believe that all education should be age appropriate. Um, those are important topics, uh, but they need to be age appropriate. Um, is it, do I believe a six-year-old child is capable? No, but neither. To be clear, again, it's, it's not being taught in our district at all. So, uh, but um, do I believe it's appropriate? No. This is Lincoln Walter. I don't know the extent that elementary students are being exposed to uh, that um, type of questioning. I, I actually, um, I believe, yes, education has to be age appropriate, absolutely. Um, we do have, uh, our eighth graders are having um, healthy, healthy kids curriculum where out of 11 modules in a, a class, about seven or eight of them actually deal with gender identity, um, and only three or four deal with pregnancy, STDs, um, that sort of thing. Um, I think that even um, e even older than six, I, I think that gender dysphoria is is very common in our culture today. Eighty percent of kids grow out of it. Sometimes it's not till their twenties. Uh, the brain is still developing until age 25, actually. Um, but no, I don't think it's appropriate to be um, bringing up these topics, whether it's in read-alouds or suggesting it through some of the books in our libraries that, um, you know, I think it needs to be dealt with on an individual basis. I don't, I think we're broad brushing it and causing problems for our kids. <laughs> And uh, I, I want to thank all of you for being very honest. These are questions that have come from um, uh, people uh, through our website and from, from your here. church. So these are from your church. Concerns. But what I would like to uh, to offer now is that uh, now is time for if you have questions from the audience to come please form over here, and uh, we'll be taking questions from you, and you can ask the candidates yourself. Uh, but I would like to uh, give each candidate about two minutes to actually introduce themselves 
and yes. say a little bit about their campaign since we did not do it at the beginning. And you've got two minutes, guys. Wow. <laughs> My name is uh, Mark Spratchoff. I've lived in uh, this district since uh, 2008, but I've taught in this district since 2003. I had the privilege of teaching Spanish at Norwalk High School for 15 years, and I love this district. Uh, there's great things going on, and I, after teaching this district, now I wish to be a board member, and I have been, because I, I know we can do great things, and we, and we are doing great things. I, I champion the good work going on in this district. Uh, my passion is education. Uh, now I teach, I'm still an educator, now I teach at Trinity Law School as a law professor. On the school board, I bring my unique perspective as a parent, an immigrant, and a teacher to support students and parents, staff, teachers and staff. As a parent, I entrust my child to this district. My daughter goes to this district. We must honor our parents' trust through transparency and open communication, and I encourage continued parental involvement. As an immigrant, I came to this country 40 years ago fleeing communism. Uh, ninth of 11 children grew up in, on welfare and food stamps. Uh, I had to learn English as a kid. I felt out of place. I was not the kid that, that knew what was going on language-wise or anything else, but it was a free public education that let me succeed. That is the great equalizer in our country, having a free public education, which is why I'm passionate about continuing the excellence of free public education. Uh, because, of, uh, because of my background as an immigrant, I believe that our <clears throat> programs should be guided by community values and respect for diversity, uh, not impose divisive ideology. As a teacher, I know how important it is that district policy support the classroom. And <clears throat> uh, while remaining fiscally prudent, I do support lowering class sizes. I support <clears throat> advocating for ad adequate staffing and resources at every school. I will not rubber stamp proposed curriculum, policies, budgets. I consider them from the perspective of a teacher and a father who knows how district decisions impact the community. If you want a board member with this passion, integrity, and experience, uh, I respectfully ask your vote, re-elect Nargis Prashaw for school board. Well, uh, even though it has been a bit nerve-wracking, it's really been an honor to be up here and get to share with you. Um, my name is Becky Langenwalter. I've been a resident of La Mirada for 37 years. Uh, my husband grew up here from the age of eight. Um, I'm a parent, a grandparent, a marriage and family therapist. Uh, four generations of our family have lived in La Mirada. I've been here 37 years and 23 years uh, as an employee at Biola. Our children went through the schools and I currently have a granddaughter attending, so I have some skin in the game. But I also care about just these other generation that we're gonna be living with and um, I want the best for them. Um, I'm a business owner who understands how policy decisions affect everything from fiscal health to mental health. And I see how policy decisions affect academic success. I'm running for school board, uh, not as a stepping stone for higher office, I started attending board meetings about a year and a half ago and uh, just watching the process and um, I, I do love this district. I believe that family is the God ordained unit of society and I believe family is our best hope for raising thriving, respectful individuals who will make up a respectful society. I believe that character education is part of that and also in the parents have a role to play. Uh, character education makes our school safer and society safer. Young people look to the adults around them as reference points, and kids find mentors at school when they don't have them other places. They are impressionable. They will actually believe almost anything an authority figure teaches them. So it's our responsibility to be sure we teach them things that are factually correct and uh, multiple perspectives. Um, uh, as I believe the school board should stay within its area of expertise, regardless of the name it goes by. One-sided materials that are politically infused do not have a place in the classroom. I support quality teachers and staff. Um, I uh, support campus safety. I'm, I believe education is a competitive environment right now. We need to respond to parents. We, if we lose 24 students, we've lost half a million dollars. Please, um, the next board member will select which ethnic studies curriculum we use. So I would like to be that board member. Please vote for me on November 8th, Becky Langenwalter. And um, 
Thank you for listening. My name is Rudy Miranda. Thank you. Um, I am a parent of uh, three children at three different schools in this district. Um, my kids have not only gone to schools on the Norwalk side uh, for summer schools, they've also gone to schools on the La Mirada side. Uh, so my kids don't see us versus them. My kids see the district as a whole. Um, we let them enjoy whatever the district has to offer, regardless of what side it's on. So my kids have attended actually both sides of the schools. My oldest son is now a 17 year old senior and I've been volunteering at schools. I've been active and participating since he was in preschool. I've been, I've been in the PTA in multiple roles. PTSA, I started at Corvallis because uh, he did not have one when I, when I arrived there with uh, my son Jacob. Um, school, school side councils, booster clubs, just some of the few of the things that I have done um, with, the, with the district. I've also uh, had the honor of being in the hiring panels um, and we have some, some outstanding additions to the district. We, I've helped uh, be part of the, the team that has hired awesome principals, secretaries, support staff, uh, from uh, the, the, the kitchen, from maintenance. Uh, so it's really great um, uh, honor for myself to be able to help the district. So being a volunteer and being part of the school uh, district as a whole for so long, um, being on the school board is basically going to be an extension of why my priorities and my commit commitment to this district, not just of myself, but of my family. If you know my family, um, every one of my children and, and my wife volunteer at every all the schools that we've attended, plus some others that we're not even part of. Um, so we are very involved. We love the, like I said, the district as a whole. Uh, my goal is to provide stakeholders, the, the parents, the students, and the edu educators, an equitable and welcoming environment with fiscal responsibility. I want to be that vote that says what this is what's best for the student, not just what's best for my side of the town. point of reference here. Uh, I wasn't called for the last four or five questions, so you know, I just want to say the form is supposed to be level and even. So far, I don't think it's been that way. Um, now, let, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a straight shooter. I, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I look at, 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 a, at facts. I'm an electrical engineer. My name is Jorge Tirado. I'm an engineer. I'm a business owner, entrepreneur, husband, and most importantly, I'm a father of kids in this district. Woo! I'm running for a second term on the school board because I believe that I bring a well-rounded perspective to the position. We need sound leadership that is capable of seeing beyond where we are and see what we can be. As a parent with students in the district, a parent with special needs children, I offer a perspective that is often overlooked. As an engineer, I'm comfortable with numbers and technical readings. I understand new technologies, and I'm fiscally conservative. I am comfortable in analyzing systems and how they can be continuously improved. A little bit about my background, I grew up in East LA. My family is a first-generation immigrant family. My parents gave me the opportunity to attend public school. I couldn't, we couldn't afford uh, a private school. I was able to take advantage of all the programs afforded to me. My parents were not able to pay for my education. I reassured them that I would pay for my own education. I joined the United States Marine Corps in part to get help for school and the other was for the love of my country and, and, and service to it. The Marine Corps taught me many good life lessons. When I got back, I wanted to keep studying and become an engineer like I had wanted to when I was in elementary school. I attended East LA College, University of Southern California. I was helped along by those encouraging teachers that I met at public school. 25 years I worked as an engineer. Right now I have my own business. Uh, uh, and one of my concerns is that 
We do not graduate enough engineers. China graduates 250,000 engineers a year. We graduate 35. It's a national security issue for us. We need to pay attention at our academics and give our students the support they need. Fighting over all this other stuff that, believe me, if it comes to in front of me, I'm gonna vote it down. We need to join together and make sure we prepare every single student out there to be the best person that they could be. If you want to do that, come and join me. I'm, I'm your candidate. If you don't, don't worry. I'm still going to fight for your child. Woo! Woo! Great speech. I hate going after Lord Hay. He's just so great. <laughs> He's a lion. And so, well, why don't we have uh, introductions? But good evening, everyone here. Uh, my name is Rob Cancio. I'm a combat veteran, I'm a former educator. I'm a businessman, I'm a board member for the Norwalk Lamarai Unified School District, and I'm currently a, a statistician working for the largest financial and commodity market in the New York Stock Exchange. So essentially my work, what it does is it lays out the groundwork for billion dollar mergers. So I see the big picture, on what works and what doesn't work in the business world. So I understand finance and I look at our individual line items when it comes to budgets. Um, I would like to thank everyone that's here. Uh, I'm sure you would rather be somewhere else. Uh, but your presence here really gives weight to the idea that education and our school system is an active concern for all of our community. And essentially that's why I'm here. Because the charge for school board is not about sitting in a boardroom, it's not about sitting on a dais, it's about making decisions for 16,000 dreams. Decisions that will influence the lives of thousands of stories, of life outcomes, and of a whole generation. Anyone that knows me here, I went to La Mirada High School and I had a 1.5 GPA and I earned a doctorate afterward, and I became a board member after that. And that's because Norwalk La Mirada Unified School District provided me and my family that added support, that added dedication, that persistence, that patience, and most, most importantly, that love that many of you here share for our community. My service, my education, and my work has developed my worldview that a good education is a foundation for a better future. And I'm running for re-election because our students deserve great teachers and safe spaces to learn. And our teachers and our staff deserve safe spaces to work and the support they need to be great. So please remember to vote cancer. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Casey Chattel. Um, uh, I have a four-year-old son. Uh, he's just recently started in the district, so um, I have fairly new skin in the game. And um, uh, I've been a, um, a resident of La Mirada for four years as well. Um, um, and I plan on being here for, uh, for until, uh, until I retire. Uh, so I plan on being here for the long haul. And uh, uh, really just, um, I'm just, uh, I'm just a common dad that's uh, looking to try to do the best for his kid. Um, I, I may not have as much, as much experience as the people who are currently on the board, but uh, my goal is to just try to be a voice for just the uh, regular families out there. Uh, we have a lot of families, uh, young families in our neighborhood that I just wanna be a voice for them. Um, I work uh, locally here as a firefighter. Um, I work overtimes regularly here at the station right next door. Uh, so this is my community and I want to just be part of it and try to do the best for my son and just for everyone uh, just who's in the same shoes as me. Hello and thank you for being here. My name is Norma Nespa. I am a product, product of an LAUSD. Yes, I was and I am proud of it. I grew up in a very low income community in downtown LA and yes, I was a team mom. But education was always important to me. I knew that I wanted to do better for myself and for my son. So I continued and I further my education. I got my AA degree in child development. I went back to school and got my bachelor's degree in human development, still with many adversities that I had to face. But there was a lot of people there to support me. And those support groups are who we should have in our schools. Those counselors, those mental health specialists, those psychologists, they're needed. They're needed because women or young men like also, in our schools need that support, that additional support sometimes they don't get at home. So yes, I was a team mom, and when we talk about all the issues that we were discussing earlier, yes, I had a choice, and I chose to, to have my child, but I knew it was hard. 
and I further my education, and here I am. I got my master's in early care and education, and I love what I do. I serve, and I've been serving since I was very young. I work for a nonprofit organization, the Mexican American Opportunity Foundation, and I oversee more than 300 people, including custodians, homemakers, teachers. It's an early care and education program in seven counties. And I love what I do, I love serving. That's what I I'm intended to do, and that's why I joined the board. How did I get in? I got appointed. And I got appointed because the board members that were there saw the passion, the passion and dedication I had for my community, our community. So what am I here for? Okay, I'm committed. What am I committed to do? To working in collaboration with our school board, our superintendent, administrators, teachers, school employees, and community stakeholders. And most importantly, our students and their parents to ensure that we continue to support high student achievement and great educational and career pathways for their success. As a returning board member, what would I do? Focus on student and school safety because we know it's needed. And we are working on that. And you'll see many changes coming in. Provide help and support and resources for our students who suffered academic loss during the pandemic. We know it. There's many teachers here that know there's many students that suffered. And we need to provide them the adequate support so that they could move on and succeed. Strengthen parent and community engagement because like I said, I was a teen mom. And some parents need that extra support. So we wanna make sure that we are strengthening that engagement that we have with our, with our families in our community. Bringing them in, making sure that they're part of the process. Not just, oh, that's a parent. No, they're part of the process. They're learning. They're learning with us because they want the best for their students. Increase social emotional learning awareness among educators and students and families. We've been doing that a lot. Um, with the pandemic hitting, we were able to um, get resources, money that um, gave us enough resources to bring in extra additional support for social emotional learning. Tanla has offered many, many good classes for and trainings for our teachers, so we thank you for that. We, I also want to make sure that we have equity and reaching opportunities for English language learners because in Nova Clamarada, we do have many students that are English language learners. We want to make sure that they have the adequate tools so that they, took, they can succeed as well. And of course, advocate for early care and education programs because that is the foundation for lifelong learners. Those are the, those, those kids, those young kids, those four-year-olds, three-year-olds are the, the, main, the main piece and, and she'll talk about it because we're in the same field. If we help them, they're gonna succeed. So I look forward to continue serving the Nova Clamara Unified School District and I hope I can count on your vote because I do, in my heart, I'm passionate, I care, and I wanna make sure that our students, our families, our stakeholders get that respect and attention that they deserve. So vote November, please, your vote matters and make sure that you go out there and vote. I was born in, um, in Ecuador, I'm an immigrant, uh, to the United States from the age of five. And so I was a dual language learner. And as a teacher, I know exactly what the challenges are. And as a student, the challenges they face, learning two languages and content at the same time at a very young age. I think I have to speak a little yeah. higher. Yes. Like this. There you go. Uh, I'm a mother. I'm a, I'm a grandmother, I call myself Mimi. I'm a mother, a Mimi, and um, a teacher and a business owner. The, um, I grew up in a low income neighborhood as well, and we have many challenges, um, inadequate education. And um, something very different about me, I think, is that I deeply value and care for children, all children. And I have been on a journey and on a mission for the last 30 years, impacting education for the cause of children, educating and advocating for children and their families and preparing their teachers. I, um, as your next board member, I, I want to ensure that I will do everything possible everything that I can to make sure that they have a high quality education that they need and that they deserve. And why am I able to do this? Because I have 30 years experience in education. I started off as a kindergarten teacher for 14 years as a parent educator, parent adult 
educator for 13 years. And during that time, I also became a university professor and researcher, preparing future high quality teachers for education, developing curriculum, writing curriculum that is state approved, nationally approved, WASC approved intervention programs and all that. And that whole time, I kept trying to find and just looking for the different areas and gaps and the needs in education and the students and addressing those through all those different uh, programs. And the last thing that I want to say is that I, um, I value children so much that I'm also just recently started a corporation and the tagline is every child valued. But so I can truly say that even if I do not know your children personally, I truly deeply value them and care about them. And with all of this experience in education and teaching, almost 30 years of education, I can say that I and my I have a PhD in intercultural education, a master's in early childhood education, a teaching credential, a child development permit at the highest level. I was always thinking about education, improving education for children. And I am the high, the only high, highly um, qualified uh, candidate here in education. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. It's never easy to be in a public setting. I, I uh, am a 30 plus year resident of La Mirada. Seven of my children have gone through the public school system here in La Mirada. Eight of my, seven of my eight grandchildren are in public school. Uh, the eighth one is two years old, so he's coming. Uh, I, I, serve on a, I, I, I serve on a service club uh, that believes uh, we change the world one child at a time. The best I service club. The I, best. I won't mention Kiwanis. Uh, here's my question. It's not fear-rooted. It's coming out of an affection for the humanities and for literature and what I grew up in a public school system. Please listen to the question. Uh, if I can change the rule a little bit, if you'll just answer yes or no, and then maybe if it hits you, just in your closing comments, say why. Uh, you, if you're aware of the book banning of historically utilized literature that is occurring in parts of our nation right now, our public school systems, are you in favor of books being banned that are, have been historically utilized as literature uh, on the curriculum, are you are you in favor of banning books of curriculum in our public schools? That's a yes or no. If you want to elaborate, do that at your closing. No. Oh, really? I believe there are some materials that are inappropriate for schools, but if things have been used for a long time. Um, Generally, I would say no, I wouldn't be in favor of banning them. We have a constitutionally um, provided liberty of uh, free speech, and banning a book goes completely against it, it's completely against the Constitution. Uh, I didn't serve in the Marine Corps to tell you to shut up and mind your own business and not learn. There's no way. So anything that goes against the Constitution, it cannot be supported. I agree. Uh, if we start banning books, we end up becoming more like those communist countries that people ran away from. So I, my answer would be a definite no. As uh, the other person that also has a PhD on the uh, stage, my answer is no. No. No banning of books. No. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for your sacrifice, because I know what you guys put into being on the board, and I appreciate that. So I want you guys to know that firsthand. I would love for each of you to share um, your opinion, your ideas about 
the in increasing overuse of technology in the classroom from digital textbooks, from worksheets just being uploaded onto Schoology for the kids to just write on an iPad instead of using a pen and paper, um, the whole gamut. I'd love to hear your opinion on that. Great question. <clears throat> it's like walk through walls for you. Oh, okay, great. Uh, well, Jack and we talked just the other night. So um, yeah, I, I'm very concerned with the overuse of digital technology. Uh, I believe in a lot of hands-on experience actually to complement uh, written, uh, written stuff. So yeah, this is a big concern of mine. Being a therapist, I see what a lot of uh, technology does to young people and even adults. So um, it's, a, it's a big concern and we have to find our way um, through this and uh, make this work a little better for our students. I think uh, the, the use of pen and paper, um, it cannot be a lost art. Uh, you still have to uh, provide it and use it and, and learn um, how, to, how to work it. However, uh, there are a lot of benefits to technology. Uh, every time you use the, the tablet to turn in an assignment, a uh, tree doesn't have to die. So there's pros and cons. There has to be a good balance of both. Uh, when appropriate, pen and pencil, definitely if appropriate. Just to say, I don't want to use the, the tablet, no, that that's not appropriate. I, I agree with my um, a little debater here. Uh, yeah, you know, we have to just um, have a balance. There should be a balance. But, you know, technology should not be what is being, is the thing. You know, I, I spoke to a real, really one of our best teachers out there. She gave an example of how we could use technology to enhance a biology lesson, right? You have the students go out there with their really nice iPad that has that super deluxe camera on there. They go to their backyard, right? They snap a picture of their backyard. That backyard picture is high definition now, right? They take it back to their, their, their uh, class. They put on some virtual reality glasses and they get a biology lesson uh, that's based out of their experiences in their backyard. You're not filling in sheets like we do right now. You're actually using technology to enhance that lesson. And that's the type of thinking that we need at the school board, that we've got this base of technology, you know, filling in a, a form, well, what's that doing? How are we gonna think beyond so that our students are prepared to use but that type of technology when they go to work. You know, some of those silicon job jobs up there, you have to have some basics of it. But as far as, you know, turning in stuff uh, that's not tactile and all that, we, we need to get away from that. We need, to, we need to get away from teaching the teachers how to do Google Docs to more something that's more interactive with the technology. So that way, it's not just a crutch, it's an enhancement. I wish I had a Uno car that said repeat, repeat, and now repeat. Uh, but but technology is a tool. It's it's used to supplement and complement uh, the, the subject matters that we're teaching in the classroom. And so it's not replacing books. Uh, the big mistake that we make is that there's a single modality when it comes to education. There's multiple modalities. I said it earlier. I had a 1.5 GPA because what was happening with me at the time at Lamarada High School just didn't work for me. But I was fortunate that we had a program like Southeast Academy that was a little more physical. Uh, it had leadership traits and it was more structured organization and that helped to be in my family, large numbers of our community. So we have to be open to using multiple different forms of technology uh, to supplement a couple of our classrooms. Yeah. Uh, so technology has its place. Um, I know that uh, there does need to be a balance like uh, the other candidate said, um, but, uh, um, um, but uh, but we need to uh, make sure to keep a balance without forgetting uh, basically um, uh, the uh, core of what we're trying to do. If we have uh, too much screen time, then uh, the handwriting um, and the fine motor skills go down. Um, uh, too much technology could uh, lead to, uh, um, to, uh, to a less information retention. But with the technology growing, it's kind of hard to avoid. So we need to just find a proper balance between that made me think about all the these bookstores that closed. There's hardly any. Books aren't important. I am a person that I need I need a book. 
I can't do it with the technology that we have nowadays. But it is important. It is important because we have to live with the days that we have now. This is now, 21st century. We want to make sure that they understand how to use that tool. You use it correctly. But books, definitely. We need to continue having books in our classrooms and making sure that our students understand the difference between screen time, digital time, and reading. Reading is important. So yes, I, I am okay with technology, but there's gonna be a balance. I think that we should limit the use of technology, in particular with the lower grades, because it impacts the social development, emotional development, language development, which impacts reading readiness and reading skills. It, in, it also impacts their uh, physical activity because it reduces it. So yes, technology needs to be limited, especially in the earlier grades, elementary grades. As a teacher in the district, I saw the transition from written Spanish books to a a course that was almost exclusively online. We had a book, but it was it was constantly it wasn't very full. It was constantly referring to the online aspects of it, and uh, it was easy for the students to just spend all period. It was easy for the teacher on my end. It was easy for the students to spend all period staring at a screen and reducing the education, reducing the actual language interaction. That was a that was a constant temptation. I had to I had to resist. Technology is important to enhance. It's important to bring, you know, I can't show a picture of Danoche Plan. I can't show, you know, I can't walk them through the virtual uh, Lima uh, through a textbook. So there is an important part of technology. However, I believe that textbooks need to be on paper. As, as a law professor right now, some of my students have the e-version, some have the, the, and I can tell the difference of my students. The ones that have the e-version have a hard time following along in class because they're not paginated. You know, go to page 317, well, wait, 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 wait. But the ones that have a paper are able to focus, and there's a big difference in the way your eye focuses on a written paper versus the way it focuses on a screen. So yes, there's an important place for technology to enhance, but textbooks need to be on paper. Thank you. We have an awful lot of questions, so if it's possible, if you can keep your answers to a minute so we can get through everyone, that would be great. Thank you. My question is regarding decline in enroll declining enrollment in our district. Um, it's a pervasive problem. Um, it's been mentioned tonight. Um, as an eighth grade teacher at Hutchinson, I teach many of our highest achieving students at our school. And each year, almost half my students leave our district um, to go to high school in other districts. When I discuss this with their parents, their feedback is that our high school doesn't have strong academic programs or effective career pathways. As a board member, what steps will you take to address this issue? Thank you for your question. Right now, I think the, the pathways um, are very misaligned. Um, you go to one school and they focus on one thing, and then you go to mid the middle school and it's a totally different pathway. So now basically you, you're lost in the path. Uh, we need to streamline it so a school that feeds into another school follows suit. So that way it'll be easier for, um, for the child to stay within something that they like. And also for the parents to have the choice to say, I want my child to follow in these steps. This is the schools that, that I want them to go to. Uh, so I think we need to streamline the, the system a little bit better, not just offer pathways, uh, just to offer them, but actually align them so that it's easier for the parents to choose a course for the child. I agree. I, I think that we have a lot of work to, to do in that area. Uh, you know, I, I know some of the students that leave uh, Mrs. Garcia's class, and it's heartbreaking to see them. They're, they have so much potential, they can make our high school that much better. Uh, and I think it starts with leadership. It starts with leaders that, that could see where we could be. Uh, there's folks in the district right now that don't have that. They have that tunnel vision. They'd rather be inside to their little hole and controlling the, that little uh, universe that they have. We need to be able to make sure that all the decisions we make are focused on a, a child's uh, a graduate uh, uh, profile. 
So that would lead us, guide us in a direction that we're able to make these pathways that, that'll go and be competitive with, with our neighboring districts to know what they have out there. We have directors that don't even know what the neighboring district has. You know, they, they have IBW uh, at Sunny Hills. We don't have it here. Well, well most of the kids are going that, that way. Well, how come we don't have that? So we need to really take a, a look at, at what our programs are, the quality of them, and, and see and, and make sure that with input uh, from our, our staff and parents, how are we gonna be competitive with just the next door, uh, next door district? So it's leadership. Thank you, this is a really important question, one, one that should have been discussed uh, earlier, but uh, echoing some of the previous discussion points, we need to connect the constellations using need, using want, and using progress, but more importantly, using data. At present, we have siloed programs. We have really great programs in some of our uh, elementary, middle schools, and even high schools, but they're not connected. We need sequential programming. We need sequ sequential programming in math and English and in, in, in VAPA. And a way that we could do this is we should start evaluating our programs, and we could use evaluations to focus on cost analysis, uh, to focus on math and English scores, see the differences between some of these programs, which ones are successful, which ones are not, and professional development for our teachers and staff. As an example, A through C internships, where we offer the A student that internship, we know they're gonna go to college, or we're gonna give them that experience, but we wanna give that C student an opportunity to be successful also. And that's what evaluation is going to do, and that's how we're gonna push our district future ready. Thank you. Um, I think it's good to, uh... Uh, to look for resources uh, that are outside, uh, um, and then uh, to uh, create public clubs uh, of the kids in different aspects. Um, just in time, I remember uh, when I was in high school, I did academic decathlon, and we went um, uh, at, at, with different schools, um, uh, with math, English, and basically just uh, general STEM. And um, I think something just along those lines, um, committees together. I think it's important to involve everyone, stakeholders, students, families, everyone, so that they could tell us what they would like to see. Um, we did find that, and then I tell you because we, we have discussed it, at Benton they have a really good performing arts, right? But it doesn't go to La Mirada. So I like what Rudy said. He's talking about making sure we integrate. If Benton is the, the school that's going to feed us La Mirada, making sure that we move those programs to La Mirada as well. Same with Hutchinson. We know that there's a good STEAM program, there's a STEM program that is working, making sure that we have it at the next level. Yes. I'm a big proponent for parent engagement, family engagement. And I believe that they should be engaged in these five uh, levels um, of two-way communication, volunteering, supporting learning at home, decision-making, and advocacy for each other and for others for others. And so why do I say this is because the best, I think that the more important and critical thing to do before we even assume what the parents are wanting or needing or what they like, we need to ask them. We need to ask them. I think it would be important to have an exit survey and get to the bottom of really like what are the reasons these families are pulling out their children because maybe the needs are not being met. And once we find those out because patterns will emerge, yeah. Uh, what those needs are, then we can work on a, uh, a plan of action to carry that out and address those gaps and those needs and uh, that have to do with program improvements so that we can continue doing what we're already doing that's good, correct, but drop the things that are not working and start new ones, start new things that we have not tried before. Everything in order to meet the needs of children and advocate for them and their families. Thank you. Many good things have been said so far, and I agree with them. I'd like to add two things, investment and alignment. Uh, alignment is also been said by our, what I mean by that, the technical word is articulation. Making sure that what happens at the lower grades is actually, follows the path to the higher grades where people are not in a silo doing their thing you know, with tunnel vision, like my colleague said, um, sometimes like their tunnel vision can be at the admin level, but sometimes also the teacher doesn't know what's going on at, with, uh, at the higher and lower levels. So there needs to be 
at, at a very specific level, more meetings among teachers among the different schools and among different levels. Uh, finally, investment. We need to invest financially in our teachers. Uh, we need to lower class sizes. You can be the best teacher, but when you have 40 kids in a science class, it's hard. There's only 28 seats at the science uh, tables. You're cramming seven kids per, uh, per lab station. Uh, we need to lower class sizes. We need to uh, have uh, investment in, in materials. I started teaching in 2003. We didn't get new Spanish books until 2017. My books were older than my kids. <laughs> so we need to invest in, in material uh, and continuously do so. Thank you. Yeah, some great ideas have been said, so I'll just mention some things I didn't hear. Um, there used to be a college-bound field trip uh, going to some of the universities throughout our state that was very, um, uh, very inspirational to, to my kids. Um, I, I am a big proponent of really rigorous academics for that college-bound student, also for the vocational path, and having students actually graduate high school with some marketable skills. Uh, one of our, we lost one student to Los Al because she can go there and do EMT training and the day that she graduates high school, she can take the national exam and, and start working and making, a, and making some money. Um, vocational, well, programs need to be aligned with local programs and resources. And um, I would like to say one other thing that I haven't heard, promoting the good things that we are doing. We need to think with a slightly more business-minded um, approach and let people know what we're doing that's good and really uh, recruit people to our district because we have some great things to offer. Thank you, Ken, it's for coming. Uh, I'll tell you right now, I believe in trade schools. I'm at Fox of trade schools. I right now am a chief engineer for Southern California Edison. And are you gonna bring trade schools back to the area because that's a lost art right now. We need a lot of trade schools. We need a lot of people. We need trade schools. We can make what we're right now if we're sitting in here in a nice air-conditioned building. So, what are your thoughts on trade schools? You know, I, I've got two two sons right now. And um, my oldest son, he, he's, he's called material. I know he is. Um, but my youngest son, you know, he, he's, he's, he's my challenge. <laughs> Um, but you know what, he's going to be fine because he's good with his hands and, and we need to have that option. We do. You know, I'm an electrical engineer. I work with electricians that make more than me. There's nothing wrong with a trade school. And that's some of that leadership that we need to make sure that we have that leader in place that is able to tap into those resources. I mean, we got the Carpenters Union. We got IBEW. We got all these different... Uh, labor groups that, that are willing to partner with us. Let's, let's reach out and do that. Let's get out of our silos because not every child is going to going to the university. I really hope Gabe makes it to the university. We're pushing him, but hey, if he becomes an electrician, I'll be just as proud of him as if he goes and gets a PhD. So yeah, I really want to This is, a, this is an excellent question. It kind of goes to what I was speaking about earlier, having A through C internships, and we're already working on it. And so I'll give you an example. With the ironworkers, we're not too far from here. They just built a new site, a new school site um, off of Carmenita. And what an A through C internship looks like is really simple. Our A students, right, your, your engineering students, we know you're going to go to a four-year, right? But we want to make you a very strong candidate to go to those particular programs that you're interested in. Well, if you're doing an internship at the iron workers, you know what, I learned about welding, right? And now you can talk about that in your personal statement. Your, your packet's a little stronger. Now for our C students, what happens? We give them an opportunity to be successful after high school, to earn a good paying union job. And also more importantly, when they take these courses, they move up and they're able now to go to those individual sites. It's about making sure all of our students are successful and using all the resources that we have and partnering together. Thank you. I'm in support of trade schools. Um, I'm a product of trade schools. Uh, I'm a firefighter and a licensed paramedic, both trade schools. Um, I personally think it is uh, a good option that we should focus on. Uh, um, it's, it's sometimes um, the preferred option for some kids. Every child is different, and I think 
Uh, some kids are directed towards a four year, some, uh, some kids are directed to a, a vocational school, and I think that we should uh, focus on identifying and seeing what works best for each kid. So I have two sons. One of them went to college, he graduated from Cal State Long Beach, and the other one didn't. He started at Cerritos and he said, Mom, this is not for me. So it's not for everyone. So what do we do at Norwalk Memorial Unified? If we want to make sure that we see if they're going to be college ready, fine, we're going to help them and support them. But some of them are going to be career ready. And you really have to support them and give them all the tools that they need. We have amazing programs already, but we can make them stronger. So that's our goal. Our goal is to have the board whatever stays. I'm hoping that we could bring them back because yes, it is important. Not all students are, are college um, bond. So we want to make sure that we ensure that if they know the career that they want to go into, that we have those resources for them. One of the things that I also would like to bring to our school district, which was many years, many of you guys probably know, financial literacy. Many of our students don't even know how to look at a checkbook because they don't use it, right? But it's important. Home economics. They can even cook an egg. We used to have home economics, and I hope that one day we could bring it back. I too support trade schools. We do have a shortage. And in society, as professionals, we are all interdependent. We do need plumbers and electricians and EMTs. And so, yes, we are all needed. We are all interdependent. I wanted to highlight the program that we do have. We currently have an awesome auto program at Norwalk High School. Ken Cook, when he's driving Crease. We have a great program leading people into that trade and that graduate making good money. Uh, I would like to see programs like that auto program at other schools and perhaps programs that, that train in other, other trades, uh, whether, you know, whether it's electrician or whether it's you know, plumbing, whether it's uh, engineering at a certain level. It's, these are things that are important for our society and not everybody's going to want to stick their nose in the book, but, but these trade schools, don't get me wrong, are no less studious. They, they have to do a lot of studying to get that right. You're dealing with electricity, you better respect it. So these are, uh, these are students that are just as smart uh, and just have a different way to provide for their family, and we are doing good things in our district. I would like to see more of an increase. Specifically, one way to do that is we have a college and, a college and career counselor, and I would like to also have a focus on trade school counselor, counselor that could point students that way as well. Thank you. I think I've mentioned it several times that I, I'm very much in favor of um, those kiddos that uh, you know are not so academically minded. They have skills using their hands, manipulating things. Wow, we want to promote that. We need them, and it, it's, a, it's a really respectable income. <laughs> um, so uh, yes, I'm highly in favor of those kids. <laughs> I think that um, we need to celebrate everybody's successes, um, and everybody's success is going to be different than anybody else. Uh, we need to celebrate whether a child goes to a four-year university, a two-year college, whether they join the military, or they go to a trade school, or they learn a skill in high school that they can make money of. Whatever that success is, whatever it looks like for them, that's what we have to celebrate. We need to market it. We need to put it up on signs. Every time a child uh, conquers something, it should be posted somewhere on the wall. Uh, those are, we have electronic signs. They can be posters. This child got to this many schools. They, they chose this one. This child is going to this trade school to be an electrician or whatever it may be. Uh, this person is going to the military. When I graduated high school, I started I went to a college and it was not for me. So I left to the Marine Corps. After four, it doesn't get much more technical school than that. So after four and a half years of active duty military service, I came home and then I finished my degree. At that time, uh, point in time in my life, that was the right time for me to go to school. Okay, uh, I'm gonna give everybody a break. Stand for like 15 seconds and air it out. <laughs> Stretch it out. <laughs> All right, okay.
a seat again. And two questions, actually. This, I've got this question. This is from one of our members that are too shy to come up here. And, uh, uh, but one, before I ask this question, and I'll ask the existing school board members, why haven't we done that? What's the holdup? You can answer it or don't, but all of these things we're talking about, why? Mr. Cancio, are you next? Uh, yes, I'm next. Okay, well, I have a comment to your uh, Kiwanis Rotary Strong. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm in the Kiwanis. <laughs> uh, so, Rich, to your question, uh, we're doing it. We're doing a lot of these implementations already. We're, we're, uh, uh, we're receptive to innovation in the classroom. I'll just give you an example. Um, one thing that we're, we're doing differently is uh, we created a, 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 everyone knows that I focus on grants, right? That's my thing, that's my superpower on the, on the board. And so I'm happy to say that we created a grant game plan and we're now welcoming $8.7 million um, for student access and welcoming an additional uh, $2.9 million. And that was a partnership that we did with the city of La Mirada uh, with then Mayor Edding and uh, Mayor Rick Ramirez from, from Norwalk uh, to increase our virtual learning environment. So we're doing it, we're putting our money where our mouth is, we're pushing the gamut forward, and we're getting the job done. So do the rest of you board members agree to that? Yes. Are you guys are doing that? Okay. We are doing the best that we can. We are, it's a new board that we, when we started, what, two years ago, there's a lot of changes that you have seen. They're baby steps, so we're getting it, we're getting it. Okay, we're gonna hold you guys to that. Yes. Fair enough? Or, yeah. uh, thank you. Uh, it's about leadership. Again, I go back, it's about leadership. You know, I, I was elected four years ago, and of the four people that were elected, I'm the last one standing. Everybody else here was not here four years ago when we got elected. And let me tell you, the board back then was not the board that we have now. The board back then, you could not ask questions. I, had, I asked 19 questions. I told them, take your time. Just answer them whatever you can. Two days later, I get a message from the from the uh, our uh, our legal counsel to cease and desist. The environment in the leadership of the board was not there for discussions. We finally have it. We finally have a board right now that we could tackle these tough issues, tackle all these. Why haven't it got hasn't it gotten done? So I, I agree with Dr. Concio. It's starting to move. We're an aircraft aircraft carrier. We're going to move it, but please, you folks, send us send us people that are open-minded, that are focused on the real issues of of getting the outcomes for our students maximized. Mm. So send us good leaders that are willing to discuss these issues. It's happening. It's it's happening slow, but it's going to happen. And I agree with my colleagues. We are doing it. Uh, we have. Uh, I mentioned the auto program at Norwalk. There's the welding program at La Mirada. Um, there's very, we are doing these, these uh, uh, technical schools and trade school programs. It will, and there, has, there has been an issue, my colleague is correct, that there has been a culture of don't ask questions. And, and that's, that is no longer the culture. That there, now the culture is yes, uh, we, have, we are more at liberty to involve ourselves and we welcome parent involvement, we welcome community involvement. A lot of these things depend on, on teachers who know the subject, teachers who have a, an interest. So, uh, you know, this is where the community comes in, in the form of volunteers, in the form of, of becoming teachers in our district to teach these other areas. Uh, you know, these, these things don't fall out of the sky. It's, it's human beings who know how to teach these technical trades. And we, so we welcome your service for our district. Thank you. I believe everybody's responded to the last question, correct? Okay, great. We're going to move this on all, along a little faster and we're going to change the rules just slightly and put them on the hot seat. Candidates, we really would appreciate if you could keep your answers under 30 seconds because we have literally an hour of questions back here. And the audience has been tremendously patient and staying. I don't see people walking out yet. So if you can keep your questions excuse me, keep your responses under 30 seconds. 
And for those still waiting patiently for your opportunity to ask a question, I ask that you keep your question under 40 seconds and not a big explanation of why you're asking the question. Okay, this will be real quick. This is for that shy member in our audience here. Uh, we need money. So should the school board sell excess unused properties either to the cities of Norwalk or La Mirada? Unused properties. Right, that's a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and we should always be in a position to make sure that we're making money, we're generating money for our schools, because once you sell it, you lose it, it's gone. Anyone else? Um, yeah, to piggyback off him, I think uh, uh, it does based off a case-by-case, -case, uh, but there is something that we, uh, uh, that we aren't using and we can use it to reinvest in something else. I think that might be a, a good idea. You know what they said. It's, it's important that we first see if, if we have say in the future we do get more enrollment. So we don't want to lose what we have, but we also have to check and see if, if it's worth keeping. And that money could be used to put back into our classrooms. Any other thoughts? Yes. Oh, sorry. Going down the line? Or? Yeah, just go down the line quickly. My turn? Yeah. Okay. Yes. I agree um, that we should, um, it would be on a case by case basis and we have to make sure that we have enough ADA money to um, have these, that these buildings are sustainable that we can um, still um, afford them. And um, if we ever have to sell, it would be, uh, I think, fiscally wise to use those funds to um, support or to pay for the uh, current programs either new ones or the existing ones that need to be, or even the uh, other schools um, that are in environment, physical environment. No, I would be opposed most of the time to selling a property. We have a, a lot of property here. The, the visionaries that founded this district planned very well. Our school campuses are bigger than most other districts' campuses, and that's because they had a vision, and I don't want to give that vision away for a temporary issue. I believe we will gain more students as, <clears throat> as people come to know the excellent programs we do have. And <clears throat> I believe that money should be made off those unused properties perhaps by leasing them. But uh, I'd be, it would be a very difficult decision to ever uh, agree to sell them. Yeah, I uh, basically case by case basis, but you know, they're not making any more real estate. So I pretty much um, would, error on the uh, cautious side and, and making sure that those properties aren't just being a financial drain, but they're actually being being uh, used to produce some type of income, being rented out to preschools, something like that. I think selling properties uh, would be mostly a last resort. Um, if you sell it, you get one, one check out of it and you're done. If you lease it, you get a monthly payment. Um, once you sell it and you say, you know what, we are expanding, we need that property back, you're gonna be paying double. So it does not make sense to just say, let's make two million, let's just get rid of it. I don't think it, that would be a last resort, I believe. I agree, uh, I'm on my third home and I wish I had kept all, all the other two, right? <laughs> three of them. Uh, so no, I, I don't agree on selling it. It's a very, very difficult decision. You know, right now we make money off of the, at the Costco over there in Norwalk. We, that, and that helps pay to rejuvenate the, uh, the playgrounds that are the different kindergartens. So we should think outside the box. Obviously, we, we you know the city needs a uh, space to do things. Maybe they could they could help with the lease or, uh, you know, there's ways to partner up so that we don't get rid of that property because you like uh, Becky said they don't make real estate anymore. Okay, that concludes it. So my question for you guys has to do with school choice. I'm a plumbing contractor for 30 years, so your previous answers regarding the trades is really important for our schools. We can find solutions. We can help kids be more successful. I graduated from Santa Fe High School with 4.3 GPA. I went to Cal Poly Pomona for aerospace engineering, but I ended up being a plumber. There's great opportunities for the trades, if you guys can embrace that. Uh, my question is for you guys, though, is school choice. 
And I think it, it, it piggybacks on what you guys were just talking about. What can we do with these old properties that aren't being utilized as much? What can we do to give parents the choice in our schools how they want their kids educated? There's a lot of options out there. A lot of people on the school boards seem to think that school choice is a bad thing because you guys are in control of the public school system. But I think there's opportunities for people like you to engage the school choice options so we can integrate them into everything we're doing to create competition. And I'd like to hear what you guys think about that. All right, why don't we start at the end and work our way forward? Oh. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I think that uh, that trying to focus uh, for trade school as a viable option is something that we should put more efforts into. Um, I think that uh, 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 some idea that uh, trade school is kind of a second option from a four-year, which I think uh, um, it's, um, it's a completely equal um, uh, choice. Uh, again, uh, for myself, I chose to go to a, a trade school um, and I chose to go that route, and I think that's a better option uh, for some people. When you meant school choice, I think some of us are confused on what you're trying to ask. Can you be more specific? Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, basically they want to know if parents can have a choice to take their children. Within the district? Yes. I homeschooled my kids for 20 years. Okay. There's charter school options. There's a lot of options for school choice. No. There was a bill that we were trying, a proposition we were trying to get passed for school choice in California. It didn't get on the ballot. Okay, Mitch, this is an appropriate in our, in our community. Understood. Thank you. I was trying to clarify. And I appreciate that. Please you the best as you can to so, understand the question. So for school choice, I'm going Thank you. That was simple. Next. I think that when it comes to uh, post-school school choice, the first thing that I think about, and I would have been endeavoring to do these last 30 years, is see what I can do to improve public education first at the different levels, teacher training, communication with parents, parent engagement the uh, high quality curriculum for children, all of that. And um, the, there are alternate uh, educational models, but they also have their strengths and weaknesses. And I think that we should do the best that we can to um, provide a high quality, uh, developmentally, culturally, linguistically appropriate education to our children. Thank you. Next. As I mentioned earlier, I, I grew up uh, in food stamps and, and welfare, and it was a free public education that allowed me and countless others like me to succeed. I do not believe in diverting public funds to private schools. We need to fund public education, and insofar as school choice means voucher, means taking away funds per student to a private school, I am opposed to that because I believe public schools are the great equalizer in our society and we must protect the funds of the public schools. Uh, thank you. Next. Um, I think there are a lot of parents that are currently, there seems to be a trend that parents are choosing, uh, making a choice to, to pull out of the public system, which is, um, it's telling us something about their thoughts. I think we want to tap in and try to give them more of what they would like so that we can keep them in our system. Um, they're paying twice when they do that. Um, this is also an opportunity for our district to lease some of our properties to some of these new groups that are um, popping up. School choice in, in uh, the way uh, Mitch really uh, was trying to frame it, um, I do not believe in that. Um, I think that if you want to move your child to a private school, then that's your personal choice. For you to remove funding from our schools for the rest of the kids that are still in public school, no. So what I believe in, in public school within the district, 
I think every parent should have a choice. If there's a better program, a better pathway that suits your child better, not better because the school is not good, but better for your child, then you should be able to choose a different high school. I have two high schoolers and they go to different high schools because their needs are met at different, different schools and it works perfect for them. Uh, you know, everybody makes a choice uh, already. Uh, when I was growing up, I had no choice. I had to go to Fort Boulevard Elementary. There was no way we could afford a private education. Uh, and if you allow the sapping of funding from public education, it's really going to affect the kids that don't have a choice. So I, I'm not for that. I think we, we need to improve our, our own uh, uh, system in here. We have great choices for our students. Uh, Rudy's uh, kids are a great example of that. Go oh, any one of our schools. We have some fantastic programs. And right now, we are making changes that are going to make the choice easy to stay. Okay, any videos? No. No, I like that. No, so I answered the uh, question wrong the first time. <laughs> okay, we're next ready for our next question. All right. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for stepping up and running for school board. The new faces that are running, I uh, congratulate you. And all those who are running for another term, I congratulate you and thank you for your service to our community and to our children and to our parents. Uh, and I know it takes a lot of boldness. So I've learned that this last few months myself. Uh, I was up there just a few months ago, so in another form. But anyways, I also want to thank you uh, for making it absolutely clear that you are not reconsidering uh, Planned Parenthood and that you let us all know that and I really appreciate that and I did uh, get the memo from you guys the statement you put out saying that you're no longer going to reconsider it so I give you uh, and again my hats off to you for that make it very clear tonight you know the parents real quick is that uh, they're a little bit concerned of what happened on July 18th uh, Newsweek did an article on it and they did say that wellness centers are are funded by Planned Parenthood so I just want to leave, like, give you an opportunity are they indeed funded by Planned Parenthood? They are not funded by Planned Parenthood. Yeah, I mean, if it's the same answer, all you can say is no. Come on down the line. I mean, it's pretty simple. Well, I'd like to. Uh, make a clarification for everyone. Uh, you know, the terms for mental health have, have changed, right? Every, oh, you, you've got mental health issues. Or, now it's called wellness, right? We created wellness centers for the kids to go in there and have someone to talk to because of the pandemic. This is not Planned Parenthood. So if you hear a wellness center at all of our schools, it's not Planned Parenthood. It's, it's a counselor there so that the kids could go and, and talk about maybe their parent that died during the pandemic. That's what we have there. We do not, do not have any of that. Now, LACO might be sponsoring someone else's, uh, quote, wellness center, but not here. No way. No way. Thank you. All I can say is I completely agree. Yeah. Repeat. Thank you. So I came to a forum for public school board candidates. So my question is around equity for our students. How would you ensure that NLM USD is addressing the needs of all students and making sure that all students have access to the best education that they deserve? I will start since um, at this point, and I know Jorge and I and the superintendent are going through an equity training. It's for Saturdays. So we're going to ensure that we bring it to our district. So it's going to take some time. We're going to put a statement. We're going to put it together. It's going to take some effort, stakeholders' input, but we are working on an equity statement coming up. Anyone else want to? Yes. Um, if I were elected, I would make sure that the funds that are allocated for those vulnerable populations are indeed used for those programs. Likewise, my would be the same in funding. 
um, that schools across the district, schools that are lower performing, higher performing, receive the funding they need, specifically in staff development and development for classified as well. The issue is funding. A lot of times the funding gets, you know, the, the squeakiest wheel gets the grease. Uh, we want to make sure that funding is equitably um, allocated throughout the district and we give the funding where it's needed most. It's not, equity doesn't necessarily mean everybody gets the same amount of money. It's the school that needs it gets it. And uh, <clears throat> one way also is the uh, the physical plant of the school. Some schools look a lot nicer than others, so equity is they walk into every school and feel at home. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Yes. 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 Um, I believe that we need to look at a case per case basis. You can't say that this school is getting low scores on on a specific science, and then be like every school gets math books. That doesn't make any sense. You have to be going to the classroom on, into the school and see exactly what the students need. And then you support what those lacks are. So you don't just do a blanket uh, for the whole district. You go to each school. What does this school specifically need? What does this child need to get to college or go to a trade school or whatever their goal is? Like that's what you've got to do. Uh, yeah, you know, equity takes many forms. Uh, there, there's some of our campuses in Norwalk that don't even have any shade structures. So equity could look like, hey, let's get some shade structures in there, right? Uh, we have some problems with shade here at, at La Mirada. What I think we need is we need, it starts with a conversation, having everybody have that conversation, invite everyone to the table and not just invite everybody to the table, look around and see who's missing. Make sure that we're all focused on make, uh, giving the students an equal, uh, um, an equitable shot at success. So this is an issue that we're sorry about that. <laughs> this is an issue that we've been working. We've been working through. At present, we have a school site uh, in our district. The only high school that's bringing us around a 1.4, 1.5 million dollar profit. Yet they don't eat the same types of foods uh, when it's lunchtime. Now I did mention the. Uh, the $8.7 million, that's a student access to college program. That's tracking our students at middle school, high school, no different than a the program. So we are addressing issues of equity. Uh, so I do think it uh, is a case by case basis. We need to review uh, basically all the data of the differences between, uh, say, test scores, shade structures, um, our students with learning disabilities being supported, just every aspect. And we need to look at each thing. And it, and identify it and then try to find funding to try to make it equitable from there. Okay, we have four more questions coming up, so thank you for your infinite patience and we're almost done here. Again, sir? How might some groups of students within Norwalk Lamar be experiencing school climate differently than others? Let me slow that down a little bit. So how might some groups of students within Norwalk Lamar be experiencing school climate differently than others. Some students had a really hard time in the pandemic. Uh, other students flourished. Uh, I mean, parents were able to work from home. A lot of our students, the parents weren't able to work from home. Um, they had to be at home, and and uh, so from having that supervision, from having from having a, a structured environment to being by yourself and your parents aren't there because they have to work outside the home even during the pandemic as essential workers. But that's one major issue. And so being aware as teachers, as classified, as admin, not every student had an equal experience the past couple years. And showing compassion on the students that have more to catch up. Well, I know because of differences in temperament, um, that some students um, experience uh, the way that, it is, say, say if they're on campus and they're poked at or maybe cursed at or something, and the way that those uh, issues, discipline issues are, are managed depends on the leadership on the campus. So I know different students, some of them struggle with that, don't wanna go back to school. So that's something that we really need to have a good uh, measured response to. Um, I want to thank the board uh, for getting the wellness centers going. Um, please 
don't get misconceptions, don't go by rumor, look up for what they're actually doing. They are providing mental health to these children that they, they had a hard time. Uh, my, specifically for, for my family, my children did not go out of the house for a whole year, okay? Um, so they all had a different experience. Some of them, um, they, they, they had no very little restrictions, depending on the family, what they want to do is choice. But once they come back into the school, they had a hard time adjusting. And the wellness center has been there for many, many, many kids. So please don't look at the wellness centers uh, under the guise of it's like, oh, it might be funded by this. Regardless, that is providing a very important service to these kids. I think that's a, that question has many layers. My daughter was attacked at La Mirana High School. She was pinned up against the wall from the gym with two boys, two girls, plucked her eyes out, eyebrows out, not her eyes. Um, we were devastated, it was terrible. I learned the biggest lesson in my life from my daughter. She forgave those kids. She forgave those kids. She, and you know what, she's right. It's those kids that we, that we lost them somewhere from, from, uh, from elementary school. It's that culture that we have to uh, develop within ourselves, within uh, leaders here, and make that go and, and, and precipitate down into the into the into the, the remaining population. It's a matter of conversations. It's a matter of understanding each other, and and it, it percolates down into the student body. So I think it, it's a multi-tiered. Uh, 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 issue. I think we're working in the in, in the right direction now, but you know it, it's still there. And the wellness centers do help. William Julius Wilson wrote the declining significance of race, and he says that socioeconomic status is going to become a more prevalent issue. Uh, we have issues of sight, access, access to uh, nuanced, culturally contextualized mental health, socio. Uh, mental health, uh, access to community resources like fields, green space. So as my colleague said, we have a, a culture of access and privilege and we need to begin to address it. Uh, so some uh, so some students uh, might be experiencing some, uh, some bullying or just uh, some difficulty adjusting after uh, just coming back from just the uh, the uh, few years of the uh, distance learning, and that's why um, the uh, the wellness centers um, to focus on mental health would be good to kind of help the kids get back into just a um, uh, just a better, more normalized uh, uh, socialization with their peers. So this tells us the importance of social emotional learning, and like I said, uh, with our with our teaching staff. Ensuring that we're giving them, providing them the, the tools so that they could help and support and they could be observant of students that are having trouble. Uh, sometimes I know that they have many students in their classroom and it's really hard for them to help and support. But yes, those wellness centers, believe it or not, have been helping a lot of our students. Sometimes, like I said, they don't have that, that parent that will listen to them. Those wellness centers and that mental health support that they're getting at the school is very helpful to, to them. So social emotional learning, We've been doing, and we're going to continue. Doing. So I think that um, both prevention and intervention programs are needed for this, and uh, we would need prevention and intervention programs for the students themselves. Maybe focus groups or something where they have a safe place. We provide for them a safe place to talk about how they feel, and then also for the teachers so that they are able to know how to navigate that and uh, help the children, their students cope and work through these different um, situations and feelings and emotions that they have. And then also um, intervention or prevention of programs for parents so that they also know what to do at home that basically will kind of um, not mirror the classroom environment but support um, what is in place in the classroom so there's continuity between the classroom and the home. And they're kind of like on the same page. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And again, we thank the candidates for keeping your answers brief and very much. We are down to three more questions and we'll be done for the evening. 
So my question has to do with the students themselves. So we have a very outdated and sexist dress code at our schools. Uh, as a mother of two girls, I do not appreciate my daughter's bodies being objectified. It is absolutely unacceptable that my daughter is pulled out of class and away from her education for showing too much shoulder. We have teachers that publicly shame and degrade girls for the way they dress, even call them names. Will you work with the students to change this outdated dress code and support their right to expression? If not, what is your plan to address teachers and security staff that prioritize clothing over a child's education? Well, that is a tough one because it's very personal uh, to kids and especially teens because they're wearing things that as they're seeking to understand their own identity. But I will say that we need adequate staffing on our schools to have people around that, that can observe what's going on and interact with these kids. I also believe that, um, that you can discipline sh students without shaming them. I, I, discipline has nothing to do with shaming unless you're just doing it really wrong. Um, so if our, if our uh, administrators, our teachers, our, our staff does not appreciate the difference between that, then they need training in how to um, have consequences for misbehavior. I'm not saying that dress like that is a misbehavior. So that's kind of a unique thing. Uh, I would probably do some focus groups and, and get some input from parents and really input from students as well and get some buy-in on what do we want, uh, what are our goals in terms of what we're doing on campus. Shaming is definitely not the answer. Um, I think this needs to be put into a well discussion and put uh, direct guidelines that have nothing to do with hurt feelings, but of actual um, learning and meet, meeting the goals of the, the kids uh, having a safe uh, place to be at school. So I would say that the, the, the guidelines need to be discussed. Um, I know some schools, they go around, around this, uh, such as Corvallis, everybody wears a polo and, and khaki pants, basically, even the females. So that gets rid of any argument of whether it's appropriate or not, because everybody in the school is dressed just the same. So that's an option, but I think it does need to be discussed and discussed appropriately, not in a shameful way. I agree. Shame not shouldn't be in a, in in any of our disciplinary actions, and you know the board policies go back years, and they're always. Uh, looked at to for review. So if we think that that's, that's something that needs to happen. I think if you make your voice heard, uh, you know, bring, bring a few friends, we could put that on the agenda and, and review it and have a committee, folks get together, discuss it and, and go through it because your view and someone else's view is gonna be heard and then we'll come up with, with something that, that's maybe not exactly what you want or what they want, but we're gonna come up with something that, that's more modern uh, than you know, maybe a policy that was put together in the 1960s or so. So, yeah. Uh, echoing my colleague here, uh, we're in the business of teaching and not in the business of punishing. And I think that reevaluating is actually a really smart exercise. Uh, we need to think about having sound policy, fair policy, uh, treating people with respect, and respect goes two ways. It's respectful policy, but also respectful programming, and that's inclusive. Uh, not to repeat what everyone else is saying, but uh, yes, I would support uh, reviewing um, uh, uh, the address codes and, and policies and looking into that, yes. So absolutely not a shaming if it's happening, and I'm hoping that you already reached, reached out to someone principal um, because it shouldn't be happening in our schools. I like the idea Mr. Torado brought up. You, you're a stakeholder, you're a parent. You can come up and speak about it in our meetings. So again, I strongly believe in family engagement and I would propose a uh, collaboration between teachers and parents through which they would identify the problem, the needs, the possible solutions to that, and together develop a, um, a, uh, a training program 
uh, for the uh, teachers, and then also just make sure that we have adequate staffing. Let me start off by saying that both boys and girls can be dressed inappropriately. And so far as uh, if there's been a history of only girls being uh, punished or, or set aside for that, that's, that's wrong. I've had to tell many of my male students, hey, uh, you know, fix that. So uh, there needs to be a dress code. Uh, there can't be wear whatever you want, but it needs to apply to what, what both boys and girls can be dressed properly. I'm for, uh, I believe, a solution like Corvallis, a school-wide uniform would remove, obviously there has to be community buy-in, but that was something that, that I would propose. Um, because at the end of the day, we are in a professional learning environment, so it cannot just be wear whatever you want. Thanks. Hi, um, I have two questions, if that's okay. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm a student at Norwalk High School. Um, this question regards 504 plans. I'm a student with a minor disability who has noticed severe underrepresentation in my classrooms. In, in my 504 plan, I have specific modifications that help me and adjust to my disabilities, but I deal constantly with teachers not knowing my or ignore it when they do. I have adjustments for my disabilities and I can't work in specific environments. I found that I have to bring them up to my teachers and let them know I have a disability. And it's degrading and I don't always want to do that. Um, what will you do to increase awareness to teachers for 504 plan? On a, a 504 plan, um, it shouldn't be up to the child to remind the teacher that they need a little bit of assistance, a little bit of help, or a little bit of accommodations. Um, there is a plan uh, in place to where at the beginning of the year, whether they're changing schools or they, the new year they're coming up again and they get a new 504, the teachers are supposed to get a class and discuss what the accommodations are for each individual student. Okay, so we have to make sure that these uh, procedures are being followed and if the teacher has a questions about how to go about the accommodations, then the clarification uh, from the administration, it should not be up to a child to say, please, I need a quieter space. It needs to be done within the procedures and the procedures are already there when you can follow them a little bit more. I totally agree with that. I mean, that hits, uh home even if you have an IEP uh, that's supposed to be reported to your teacher before now somebody dropped the ball they shouldn't they shouldn't leave it up to you to go have to go and, and, uh, and uh, re, re advocate for yourself so uh, if you do run into something like that please let us know right away I mean I'm gonna bring this up right after this this meeting because this should not happen and you're not the first one I hear about it it's happened in other places so it's that follow-through that we need to keep keep doing and making sure we're checking all the dots and dotting uh, you know dotting all the i's and crossing all the t's uh, and it, it goes down to preparation for that school year that teacher should have had your your file ready to go and they should have known you've got five people. so i wish i had and again another uno two uno cards with repeats but first first an, actually a discussion that was made earlier um, having smaller classrooms, I think, would address the situation. But more importantly, training our teachers and staff to ensure that our school site staff know that it's their responsibility to make sure that our teachers know exactly what's going on in the classroom. So it's a case-by-case -case basis, but I know this has been an issue that we've been wanting to discuss, but at the end of the day, we're in the business of making sure that you have a safe space and a safe space for you to learn. So, uh, so yeah, with this, um, so I would uh, propose uh, to uh, and and support uh, professional development uh, to educate the teachers who don't know um, um, in the procedures um, uh, for holding them accountable uh, after the 504 in their IEPs because uh, it's effectively um, uh, the uh, teachers who should be accountable. Uh, uh, my wife is actually a, a, a special ed teacher, so I hear this a lot that uh, you know she. Um, uh, uh, she focuses a lot on, on oh, oh, sorry, stop. <laughs> First and foremost, we apologize that you're going through this. That's not what we want our students to be at or feel that they're not being supported. Um, there needs to be 
a follow through and making sure that all teachers understand that when they have when a, when a student has a 504 or an IEP that we are following through and that we understand their needs so we'll look into it I too am so sorry that you've gone through that. And what I would propose is um, for the parents to um, provide the nurse, the school nurse, with the guidelines um, that she knows that she does at home from the doctor, and that the nurse communicate that to the teacher. But just in case that might not happen for whatever reason, then the parent can, should communicate to the nurse and the teacher and it would be wonderful if the teacher within a certain amount of time that the year has begun that they also just give a quick um, little uh, list of the items that how they will in that classroom in that situation throughout the day make those accommodations for you see how that looks implemented within the context of your classroom When I started teaching, we used to get brightly colored folders in our boxes every at the beginning of every school year, the first day of school, along with the brown sheets for attendance, there was a brightly colored folder with all the IEPs, all the 504s. As the years went on, that practice stopped. As a teacher, I didn't know who my kids with IEPs and, and 504s were. I had to ask. Uh, I had to go through the computer system and look. Um, maybe that starts with, uh, adequately staffing the special ed department and because they are overworked as well they're, they're working as hard as they can and bringing back the practice of brightly colored folders something that simple yeah i also am am sorry that you had to advocate for yourself uh in that way i'm not sorry for you uh because i believe that in the end i i admire that you're here tonight in this format advocating again for yourself and it's, uh, you know, it probably will be a strength of yours that you develop, but just sorry that um, sometimes the system does break down. Um, I would just encourage you, um, uh, unfortunately, it, it, there is some weight on you, um, but whenever that happens, um, it's good to speak up, just like you're doing tonight, and speak up in class. And if, if that person does not hear you, or they're so busy that they're distracted, sometimes we do have to go above that. So, um, but I hope that, uh, um, yeah, that, that that can be helpful. And I do, I do appreciate you taking this moment to advocate for yourself. Okay, my second question. I also wanted to say really quick, we don't have nurses at the school. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we don't have them. We need them. Um, yeah, we do. So this is a second question, okay? This is something that's dear to me because I feel like at school, where I should feel safe, the people making me feel safe shouldn't make me feel scared. As a student at Norwalk, um, I feel I could show you some insight from my school. I have a deep concern for student safety and comfort. There are specific things I'd like your opinion on, such as staff and security intimidation. As a student, I've been made to cry in front of friends and teachers due to intimidation through security and staff and teachers. I've been chased and flagged down by security guards. Um, and my biggest concern is that security keeps students from learning by pulling them out of class to do simple things like dress code. This last year, my amazing principal has done a lot to help this issue, or at least tried to, but there's only so much he can do. And there's some security guards that really don't care what the principal says. But NHS is not the only school dealing with this. There are schools where this has not been fixed. Where, and when my little sister gets to high school, I want to know that this is fixed, that she doesn't have to be scared by the people keeping her safe. Um, I also wanted to note that no one should feel like schools are prison with guards to keep them in there. What is your opinion on staff and security intimidation towards students? Well, that's not tolerable. Yeah. There's no way that's tolerable. Uh, you know, I think we, we need to make sure that, that we have training for our, for our security staff in, in new techniques where you're able to diffuse uh, situations differently without shaming, with, you know, there's different tactics out there. It just sounds to me like they're bullying the student body, and that should not happen. We shouldn't tolerate bullying from the students. 
Well, certainly we shouldn't tolerate it from the security oh. folks. We, we need better training. And, and having awareness of that it is critical for us to, to make sure that that's not our vision. We, we don't want security like that. Thank you for bringing this up. I, I was a student who was targeted at La Mirada High School, so I understand you, and it's inappropriate. Um, but I, I'm happy to say that through collaboration with labor partners, um, we champion school safety. So we increased the school safety annual budget. It was $200 for the whole year, $200. And now we're at $50,000 because our school safety training was defunded. And so we really have to look at these individual line items where we can save, where we cannot save. But training is particularly important and intimidation is ex extremely inappropriate. Uh, so I just uh, focus on accountability and following up uh, with each individual claim. So. Uh, uh, so if something uh, like this uh, like did happen, we can make sure to follow up and hold them accountable. Once again, we're sorry that you're going through this. And no, intimidation is, is not acceptable. And we're hoping that uh, with your story now, we, we can go back and see what's going on. But more training is necessary. I'm assuming that's what, one of the things that we, we were lacking, but we're going to get. Dr. Tassel just said it. We have additional funding, and we're going to make sure that we train. I agree with the training of security, but I also um, think that I, I would propose to a uh, anonymous uh, suggestion or concern box and uh, that the parents or the students can fill out and a team, a committee that would go through and read through the uh, feedback on there. And then um, possibly in this, after the training, an incentive program for those who are doing stellar and um, some type of sanction for the ones that are not. I'm sorry you've been feeling that way in the school. I do have to say, however, there are, there are two sides to every story. And I wouldn't be in a position to judge a security guard um, without hearing that side. And I, the, by the way, these things go be, before admin and other things way before they come to us. So. Um, yes, there's training, but um, I felt like, you know, from the, from the perspective of a teacher, sometimes a student would say, well, you're being unfair, and it was just authority as a teacher. So there wasn't, a, there is, a, there has, has not be shaming, but I would, I would want to be careful to hear both sides. Thanks. Um, yes, I would. I would echo what um, um, Nurse Brett just said. Um, uh, there is. A, there should be a review process for things like this. Um, obviously, our goal is respect, not just to keep the threat from the outside from coming on campus, but also to make it a safe environment where there are rules and people are following them. But that even the adults in charge are following those rules. All of us have to go through performance reviews and. You know, maybe this person was having a bad day, maybe they weren't, but we, we do need to um, make sure we're all held accountable um, by whoever is over us. Thank you for sharing. Just like every, everybody else that works at that school, um, there has to be staff development. Uh, so they do have to get uh, proper training. If the training is not proper, they need to get better training. Um, but also there needs to be accountability. Uh, so if something like this is happening on a regular basis, um, it should not take uh, an election year for you to discuss it. Um, this needs to be fixed and it needs to be fixed immediately. Um, like, like Mr. Prasov said, uh, we do need to hear both sides of the story, but we need to hold people accountable and provide training so this doesn't happen, doesn't get to this point to begin with. Um, I have a disability of essential tremors, so I, my voice shakes, so I apologize, just consider, take that into consideration. Um, I come to this as a 20-year substitute teacher from Norwalk, El Morada School District, and also somebody that has um, put her two sons all the way through the school district. and. Um, so my question is about the student's behavior. 
I've been in, in classrooms where uh, the few children take the priority over the majority of the children. And that's because I don't know, I don't know why, because of fear of being sued or something, but um, I notice there's a lot of, it, of hours lost for those children that are being good. Their education is lost because um, those students aren't, removed, the difficult students aren't being removed or they're not being dealt with appropriately. And then the uh, so um, my question in that is, do you support, I'm, that's a difficult question, a difficult problem that I know that we don't even have a solution to, but do you support um, an effort to try and fix this problem. And I want to say that if you spend, if a teacher spends 10 minutes dealing with a, one child, and that is, and there are 30 children in the classroom, that is five hours of education that is lost. And I mean, why did those children get all the priority? My children behave themselves. I told them, if you don't respect your teacher, then you're in big trouble. And um, I know that that's, this is still too big a problem to handle, but I, I really am angered by that. And then the other thing is, as a substitute teacher, we were able to um, turn down certain job locations. Um, and there are certain schools that I never went to. I went to once or twice, but then I, from then on, I refused because of the behavior of the students. And I just did not, and, and everybody believes the students. Students, and even, what I hate is that if I'm a teacher, I love the students. I want the best for them. I am not gonna make up a lie and say that they misbehaved just to get them in trouble. However, students have a motivation to lie to not get in trouble. So I just want to, to point that out and see what you guys think about that. So I'd like to take a stab at this. First of all, I remember you, you were my substitute teacher. Thank you for not sending me to detention or outside the classroom. Um, but we're in the business of healing. And I'm happy to say that we've increased behavioral specialists. Um, we've had some current grants. We're also looking at, uh, looking forward when it comes to uh, social emotional grants that, that have that behavioral component to it. So we're increasing that support. And that support actually happens outside of the classroom. And I'm happy to say I actually saw one of these programs at Lambton, and it's great, it's effective, it makes sure that we're keeping on instruction, uh, but it's all about culture. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, um, uh, so I would support looking into uh, better behavior management uh, procedures, uh, such as hiring um, uh, support staff or aides for these uh, particular uh, students. We are increasing, um, once again, social emotional learning. We're, that's what we're dealing with and we are working with it. So please be patient, but we are working on it. And we do know that we have those special students and we're hoping that we, as Dr. Castro just said, we are here to heal, to help and support. So yes, it, it, it must be very difficult for teachers to have to deal with, with a student that is misbehaving, but we are here ultimately to help them and support them. So yes, getting in more and more uh, trainings for our staff in social emotional learning, how to support the students, getting that extra support for them as well as for the family. Yes, I think that the teacher training and also in some cases mentoring in classroom management, uh, that is the key there, classroom management. But I think that what is also important is, again, parent education because in with some of those difficult cases, even I, I've experienced that in four, uh, 30 years of teaching, 14 in elementary school and higher education, another 14. Um, it's important for the parents to also um, just gain some more, a uh, little bit more uh, tools. They already are doing the right things, but there's always room for learning, just like for the teacher as well as the parent. And so that the parent can uh, reinforce that uh, program that's in place or that contract that's in place in the classroom so that they're all on the same page. Because I, I deeply and firmly believe on 
homeschool partnerships, partnerships between parents and teachers for the best of the students. Thank you. Two things. One, teachers, some teachers need to be trained in um, <clears throat> effective classroom management in relationships. Students perform better for teachers that, that know care for them. Uh, so th there is an issue some, with some teachers that maybe you know, that could use training. On the other hand, admin needs to support teachers. When a student is taken out and sent back to classroom five minutes later, it tells the teacher your discipline doesn't matter. Admin needs to support teachers, and if the argument is, well, that kid isn't learning that day, yes, but 39 other kids are. Those were some of the thoughts I was having, is that teachers and staff absolutely need to be supported um, when students choose to be unruly. Um, there are great programs for effective behavior management, and it really is the choice of the student to um, to to choose well and you know perhaps these wellness centers that some of the therapists there can be used to uh, do some of the more time consuming work with these these kiddos that you know maybe they came to school like someone called them special um and are having a really rough time but we definitely i i have heard from many parents and students that they uh feel like they they're they're not, their respect is not going both ways. I've talked to a lot of teachers who say they feel like there's a culture of their hands being tied. Um, so we, it's something we actually really need to look at so that we can promote a thriving culture of learning. It has to be a team effort. Um, the administrators have to back up the teachers. Uh, the teachers have to have clear expect expectations. Um, the students have to know these expectations. And when these expectations are not met, we need to bring back uh, the, the parent-teacher conference. We need to have uh, this discussion. We have to have it in writing, and the parent needs to sign out at the bottom that they understand that this is unacceptable and that um, they need to stop. But also, we have to be careful not to start leaving kids behind. Be careful that the easiest thing to do is just say, get out of my classroom. We can't do that either. Every child needs to have a proper education and just kicking them out of the classroom. We have to be careful not to go down that road. Well, um, that 39th child was, was Gabe. Yeah, he, he got in trouble. He did. He did. Um, and, you know, uh, he, he's, he's a special kid. And uh, I think we need to make sure it's a team effort, that admin is supporting the teachers. We have clear expectations. And let me tell you, support in the early grades that's make it makes the world difference we had a, a play works at at la pluma when my students my students were there or my kids were there and when play works taught the kids how to uh diffuse their their uh, their arguments through rachambeau different practices and the temperament in the in the uh in campus was way low all of a sudden the principal wasn't spending half her day with discipline problems it's a, it's a team effort. We need to support those students that hey, they just can't stay still, but we need to do it in a way that we don't exclude them completely from the lesson. So let's keep Gabe in the classroom somehow. I think we need to support him in different ways. Thank you. Well, thank you. We're down to our last question, and I thank you for your infinite patience on both the candidates and the public, and here we go. I thought that was a Okay, question. sorry, I'm back because I keep hearing parent involvement, parent engagement as being an important thing. Um, and so my question is, we currently have a policy, I've been told district-wide, of parents not being allowed on campus for drop-off and pickup, among other times, unless you're on PTA, which is why I begrudgingly am on PTA, so I can get on campus. But if parent involvement is important, what are some things that you guys either on the board are willing to do or the, you, those that want to be on the board would be willing to do. I understand still keeping the kids safe, but in a way that still allows parents to be involved because some of these discipline issues, if the parents are able to have the casual interaction with the teacher, gone. If the parents are able to have one, two minute, like, how do you do today? Gone. But we have eliminated that as a district. And so I'm wondering what you guys would do to change that, if you think that's a good policy, et cetera. Thank you. All right, so one 
breath real quickly. You're talking about two issues. Number one, parent involvement. Um, you know, you can't uh, force a horse to water, right? Uh, my parents weren't part of PTA and they never were involved, um, but they were very intimately involved in wanting to make sure I had a good quality education. And so we have to meet parents where they are. Uh, number two, and we had this discussion already about having access to campus. Uh, you know, we're coming out of the pandemic. You know, we're also talking about safety issues. Um, we're revitalizing our safety issues here in the school district. And so just be patient with us. Culture is significantly important. That's the signature of our district, of having families involved. Um, but at present, again, we're revitalizing all of our policy to, to fit the new needs of our district. Thank you. Um, so this is actually one of the reasons why I'm actually trying to run for school board, because I'm a new parent, and so I'm trying my best uh, in, in like any way to uh, get involved. So uh, for me, I just want to uh, try to focus on, on encouraging uh, like good communication between the parents and the teachers. You know, um, when my son's in preschool, we have like a little Remind app that we can communicate with the teachers and just uh, something along those lines um, that would be good for communication. One of my focuses is, is parent engagement and parent involvement. But it is hard, we also have to think about the teachers and, and, and the environment in the classrooms. If we have all parents coming in, it's, it's a disruption to their their, um, their day or their environment. So yes, I, I do think it's important that they come in and they, they support. And we are gonna work on policies. We're, we're revising them and we're hoping that they get better so that they're more friendly for our parents. As I mentioned a little earlier, there are about five or six types of uh, parent involvement. And so, for example, the two-way communication, that can still happen because we want parents not only to receive communication from school, but we want to be able to receive communication from parents. That can happen with text, with phone calls, with the folder that goes back and home, back and forth from home to school. Um, then there's volunteering. Some can go, if they, if they cannot volunteer at home, there are other ways to volunteer. They can cut at home, fill blue bottles at home, they can call from home, they can prepare projects or materials from home. There's a lot of different ways there. And then just supporting learning at home, there's another partnership. The way we send homework home, the way the activities that I sent that hopefully are um, activities or experiences that they can do together that are interactive and doesn't feel like pulling teeth, but that they can all be involved together at home. That's also parent involvement. There are, very, there are different levels and different types of parent involvement that we can say that in. Thank you. Parents knowing what's going on. Uh, 10 years ago, I was a foster parent in this district. My son went to, my foster son went to Norwalk High School. And before that, I had two uh, foster girls at Garden Hill. They, um, I didn't know it, what was the lesson, what, what, what's going on in your classrooms. School feels like, for many parents, felt like a black box. You take your kid there, you have no idea what they did, and then they reappear at the black box at 3 o'clock. Uh, so having a specific way is sharing the agenda of the lessons with parents so they know what to discuss, how to reinforce. And secondly, parents need to know what's going on at the school district level with the agenda, which is why I've been posting the agendas. Thank you. Yes, I think that um, uh, this is one of the greatest losses we've suffered as a country that uh, where it used to be that parents would um, be welcomed on campuses and it was a very natural flow for, especially for elementary student uh, age students, and the parents were welcomed on campus. I, I hope that we can get back to that somehow, so have some type of safety program in place because that's a huge part. I, I know not every parent wants to come on campus and be there when their kiddo gets dismissed and walks out the door, but, but it's a really important experience for the parents that want to and for the children whose parents are willing to do that. I miss the days when I used to just be able to walk on campus and go hang out with a teacher and help her out. I used to sharpen pencils for them. We used to clean the board. Whatever they, they wanted, you check in at the office, you sign in, and then you go volunteer for a teacher. Sometimes in elementary, you used to volunteer for multiple teachers because they were in separate grades. Um, however, the child's uh, safety has to be paramount. So we have to have policies that reflect that it has to be safety is paramount uh, so if if you want to be on board please by all means there's uh, several things you can do at the school school site council pta please don't join it begrudgingly i 
worked for the, or not worked for, but uh, work uh, been in PTAs for about 17 years now, or, or sort of, I'm sorry, I'm doing the math wrong, I'm sorry, 15 years. Um, and I, I loved it. I still love it to this day, and I will continue to love it. Um, please be part of uh, this community that helps the kids. If you want to spend more time with them in the school time, please, just, just school site council, PTA, there's other activities, booster clubs, uh, come, they'll allow you on campus if you're helping out. Um, well, right now, you know, we came off of the pandemic and then Uvalde hit, and right now we have a, a safety stand down. It, 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 uh, it's a very important thing that we need to do to review our safety protocols right now. So this year, yeah, you're experiencing that. You, you can't go inside the campus, but we need to have the structure in place so that you, we're able to go back and do that. And I miss the days of sitting, you know, standing next to your student, uh, waiting in line. Ms. Nima, we, we were in her line and we'd be chatting with the other parents, you know, getting to know the rest of the kids. That's the community of, of school there. And we hope to bring that back. But right now, because of what happened, in, you know, across the, in, in Uvalde, Texas, we're taking a stand down. We have to make sure we, hit, we get it right. And of course, our parents are always welcome to our campuses. We love the partnership that we have with you, and we, we thank you every day for sending your child to our, our school. Well, with that, we wrap up. No, 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 no. That, that's it. Sorry. That's it for the evening. We're actually a little bit past our bedtime. Yes. Anyway, <laughs> um, I want to thank uh, Emil for being our timer this evening, and again, thanks for all our applause. Definitely want to thank our moderator, Gracie, that came all the way from the East Coast. Thank you very much, Gracie, for that. I also want to thank the La Mirada City Council for the generosity of sharing this multi-purpose room for the children. Thank you guys, you guys are the best. <laughs> Finally, I want to thank all the candidates for attending to this candidates forum. And uh, there was a little heat in the chili. Hey, that's what it was all about. Thank you all for coming this evening. God bless you all, and God bless America. All right, guys, Tony Aiello here. We're live at the Lomrod Activity Center. Thank you for the Lomrod Chamber of Commerce for hosting this event tonight. It went a little uh, longer than expected. Thank you for hanging with us. You can check the replay later. Again, we are live from the Lomrod Activity Center. This is a Lomrod blog YouTube channel, and we will catch you guys all next time. Have a great evening.